Go up there. Come on. Don't be shy. Come on, young man. You need to sit on the other too. He wants to grow up to be just like him. It's going to be in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> You're in the San Dimas Hall of Fame now. <laughs> Barrett, do you mind getting the picture? There you go, on three. One, two, three. Perfect, thank you. Oral communications. Members of the audience are invited to address the City Council on any item on this agenda or not on this agenda. Public comment will not be taken during each individual agenda item except for public hearing items. Comments on public hearing items will be heard when that item is, is scheduled for discussion. Under the provisions of the Brown Act, the legislative body is prohibited from engaging in discussions on any item not appearing on the posted agenda. However, your concerns may be referred to the staff or set for discussion at a later date. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Madam Clerk. The first speaker is Margie Green with the Historical Society. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much again for a wonderful weekend. I'm Margie, and I represent the uh, San Dimas Historical Society tonight, and we had a trunk or treat car at the event over the weekend. I don't know how you guys did it, but it was really a wonderful, wonderful Halloween. Had a great time. Now it's our time to entertain. So we have a free walking guided tour of the downtown of San Dimas, and this will be on the first Saturday of the month, which is November 5th. And the walking tour starts at 10 in the morning. We meet over the newly painted, beautiful Walker House, which is going to be used as, well, I'm not, I can't even say it. Anyway, it's going to be used for Halloween this weekend, but it's going to be all cleaned up, and the Historical Society will be doing its walk November 5th. And we're going to have a great time doing that. So meet at the Walker House on the newly painted veranda that looks so nice. And that's at 121 North San Dimas Avenue. And the walk takes about an hour and 15 minutes. And it's good for a whole family. Bring your children, whatever. We also have a gift shop and a museum on the second floor at the Walker House. So plan on coming to that. It's open from 10 in the morning and it stays open until one in the afternoon. Uh, it is great fun, so please come by. And if you would call and let us know, you can leave a message on the machine in the office. We're not always there, especially with all the festivities that are going on this week for Halloween. But if you would leave a message uh, for Dave Harbin, and that's 915-990-3395, uh, or the Historical Society office, and that number is 909 five nine two one one nine oh uh just leave a message let us know that you're going to be there so we're expecting you also i want to tell you about what we've got going in cahoots with the uh, chamber of commerce every month the chamber of commerce has a mixer and we've chosen december because it's a great month to ha excuse me november because it's a great month to have a mixer and what it is it's inviting all the people that want to to come visit the Historical Society, it's our turn for a mixer for the chamber, but in the Historical Society on the second floor. We have a gift shop that has a tremendous amount of great things that have all been donated to us. We'll also be open for tours of the museum. We'll be having docents there that can tell you the history of San Dimas, answer a lot of questions. But mainly we're going to have food and, and uh, uh, the gift shop will be open. Last year we had a hundred or so people in there. We're hoping to overdo that 
at this year and have even more. And that's November 17th at 5 in the evening. So 5 to 6.30, come on by for our open house uh, from the Chamber of Commerce for the Historical Society in the Walker House. So we've got two things going, and that is the free walking tour on November 5th of the downtown area, and then we have November 17th. So hope to see a lot of people there enjoying the Walker House and the Historical Society. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you. Next. Mayor, those are all the speaker cards that have been turned in for items not on the agenda. Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak to any, uh, to speak oral communications to anything other than a, a uh, um, public hearing? Seeing none, we'll move on to the con consent calendar. All items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and we will be enacted by one motion unless a member of the city council requests separate discussion. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Hearing none, consent calendar uh, is approved. Next item is the San Dimas, San Dimas Housing Authority public hearing. Discussion and approval of sale of transfer of 123 North Monta Vista to the Pomona Valley Habitat for Humanity uh, Incorporated. Staff. Yes. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, and members of the public. My name is Lily Flores. I'm the housing manager. This public hearing is to consider and approve a resolution authorizing the transfer of the Housing Authority owned property located at 123 North Monta Vista to Pomona Valley Habitat for Humanity Incorporated for the construction of one single family affordable home and upon completion to sell the completed property to a qualified buyer. On September 28, 2021, the Housing Authority approved a partnership approach with the Pomona Valley Habitat to sell the vacant land with a covenant to construct a single-family affordable home. The property is located in the city's downtown core and has been a vacant lot since the demolition of the uninhabitable Taylor House in November 2017. The property has a lot area of 3,500 square feet, a width of 35 feet, and a depth of 100 feet. Construction plans previously generated and approved by the city will be utilized to build an approximately 750 square foot single story home with a single car garage. Plans have been placed at the dais for the council's information. For the past few months, staff has been working with Habitat on a, an acceptable agreement for both parties. Here's a summary of the agreement. The sales price to Pomona Valley Habitat is $250,000, which will be secured by a promissory note for the full amount secured by a deed of trust. The note shall not bear any interest unless a default occurs and will not require any payments during the 24 months of construction. The Pomona Valley Habitat note shall be considered paid upon the sale of the property to a qualified buyer who will in turn take on a new note for the 250000 secured by a deed of trust in a second lien position in favor of the housing authority against the property. The new sales price will be an affordable housing price as determined by Habitat. The new housing authority note shall have a 45-year term. A covenant will be executed by a qualified buyer which will run with the property for 45 years, restric restricting the property solely for use as an affordable house. The, co the covenant will specify the property must at all times be the primary residence of the qualified buyer and they may not rent it to any third parties and the property must at all times be maintained as a drug-free environment. If the buyer desires to sell the property during the covenant period, Habitat shall have the first right of refusal to purchase the property, qualify a new low-income buyer, and resell the property to a new qualified buyer. In the unlikely event Habitat elects not to exercise its right to, of refusal, the city will have the right, but not the duty, to purchase the property at an affordable sales price. 
Pomona Valley Habitat will use its existing procedures for the selection of the buyer who, if at all possible, will be a disabled veteran whose family income does not exceed 80% of the median income adjusted by family size as established by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development and as published annually by the State of California Department of Housing and Community Development at a 30% affordable housing cost. Habitat has agreed to solicit and advertise for a qualified buyer in the San Dimas area. The qualified buyer selected will need to provide at least 250 hours of volunteer labor for the construction of the house, which Habitat refers to as sweat equity. In conclusion, staff recommends that upon the close of the public hearing that the Housing Authority of the City and San Dimas Adopt the attached resolution approving the transfer agreement by and between the San Dimas Housing Authority and Pomona Valley Habitat for Humanity for the sale for the real property located at 123 North Monta Vista with a covenant to construct one single family affordable home and upon completion to sell the completed property to a qualified buyer who has contributed sweat equity to the construction. That concludes staff presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Additionally, I'd like to introduce Habitat for Humanity's Exec Executive Director, Christine Charlin, who will provide a background on Habitat for Humanity and who can answer any questions the council may have. Thank you. Christine. Thank you so much, Lily. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Christine Charlin, Pomona Valley Habitat for Humanity. Really excited to be here and um, be talking about this project coming to fruition as far as the transfer is concerned. But um, Lily did an excellent job um, describing how wonderful the habitat process is. Um, we've been blessed to be able to build in the 16 cities that we serve, San Dimas being one of them. Uh, for the last uh, 32 years. Uh, we've built 48 houses. We're starting our 49th and 50th in the city of Chino Hills. And our first house was in the city of San Dimas. And the 51st house will be in the city of San Dimas. So we're really proud about that and uh, excited to be able to bring another opportunity for a family to have uh, a hand up um, instead of a handout and build some economic mobility by owning their own home with a very little uh, down payment habitats model. Um, is we, we ask for a small down payment towards closing costs and uh, basically $2,500 and um, then they do the 250 sweat equity and we work that, that purchase out. Um, so it really is a wonderful opportunity and what's crazy is we're doing selection for uh, Chino Hills right now and um, people don't believe that it's an opportunity. It's hard to get people to understand, yes, Habitat really happens. So when we do advertise for the selection process and people are interested in applying for uh, this Habitat home, I encourage you to come to the meeting. Um, constituents um, of San Dimas, please um, come and learn about the Habitat program because uh, it does really change lives. And I'm happy to answer any questions about this particular project. I, 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 I do have a question. Yes. And uh, thank you for your work. I remember that first project. Uh, I think it was 4th Street or 3rd Street, the Pearson House. Yes. And uh, that was a success uh, knowing the family and, and how they, pro they uh, benefited from that um, is, is really the, the whole point of, of the program Excellent. For, for somebody who needs it. Um, I have a question, and this is on um, in our agenda pack at page 66 or page 2 of the transfer agreement, and it has to do with affordable housing cost. And I just wanted to be get it clear in my mind, and the public may be interested. Um, it talks about affordable housing cost, and of course there's a formula, and it's adjusted, as it says here, for family size appropriate for the site. And it goes on to say that the, uh, the family size is the number of bedrooms plus one. So in this case, there are two bedrooms, and there's, so plus one is family size is three. So that's the affordability index that we would be using from the HUD numbers in LA County, whatever, whatever that, that was. What I'm interested in is if there's a family of four or some other number, is it still, is that, is that part of the formula still at three or does a larger family get a bigger discount 
or, bit, or a lower price because of the, or, or qualifies at a lower income because of that? Yeah, so we take the HUD guidelines as far as housing or um, family size, and we make sure that whoever the qualifying buyer is, their house payment is in all of their housing costs is no more than 30%. So 30%, in this case, we're looking at somebody who's AMI 80% or lower, and we'll make sure that we create that sales price to be no more than 30% of their income. So as far as if there's four people in the family, it would be, we would base it on the four people. So of course then their numbers change a little bit. But you do base it on the, the four people as opposed to the three. If, if we're able, if that's who ends up applying for the house. A two bedroom house, four people, depends on what, I mean, we'll have to see what the pool looks like. Okay. We, our goal is to serve as many people as possible too, right? I mean, that's kind of the, the goal is let's house as many people. So if it's a family of four versus a family of three, we're gonna probably try to serve that family of four. And it's 30% or of the their housing of the housing of their housing income, and they qualify based on their current the four people in the family, or is it just person. the three people? So, so then I guess the only follow-up question is why is this definition that talks about yeah three people? If I can the, jump in, the, okay, yeah. I think you hit on the point, John. The agreement right now says that. Uh, the, the sale price of the house must be affordable for a family of th a household size of three. Yeah. Regardless of how many people actually live there, the agreement says that the, ha the sale price to the buyer must be affordable for a very low income family of three. Uh, so if that is not the desired um, term, then we'll need to yeah. amend the, the agreement. It's, okay, so that's that's a question then. Do we need to make a change of some kind here so that so that it could be, as you said, a, a different number if it was a family of four? If that's what you p would like in the agreement, I'm we're good with whatever you would like. Habitat's just here to serve um, the constituents of San Dimas and you um, with a, a a family that's going to be in need, and the m more people, the better, as far as Habitat's concerned. Affordable, affordable price for a family of three is, um, I think, would qualify lower income families than affordable price for a family of, I think it'd make the purchase price lower than if we changed it to affordable price for a family of four. Does it? Okay. Correct. I mean, I'm fine with that. I was just trying to get clarity on it. So, okay, that's fine. Essentially the qualifying the, the family of three, we'll, we'll get a very low price, which will be Okay, good. thank you. That's all the questions I have. I will ask a question, and uh, it just has to do with timeline. So when you do a project like this, when we transfer the property over to Habitat, what does the, the realistic timeline look like from now until uh, shovel and hand breaking ground? Excellent. Um, so we do need to fundraise. Um, new project, uh, new fundraising. We've already started that kind of um, very quietly because we're not necessarily right there. But um, we do have a campaign that we'll run um, to generate funds. Uh, the purchase price habitat, um, the note that's coming is 250000 We estimate that it'll be about the same amount for construction costs um, given the state of um, supplies and things now. Um, so we'd like to raise at least half of those funds. Uh, before we break down, but there'll be plenty of things going on behind the scenes because we'll have an escrow, um, we'll have some um, geotechnical things that'll have to happen. So kind of everything runs in tandem. So we're, I would say, you know, summer next year. Okay. You'll likely see, but we, like I was explaining to Lily, there'll be things where we have construction fencing happening. And, and if you're in construction, you understand that just because there's not bulldozers and dirt flying doesn't mean there's construction not happening because there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes. So, and that's the most frustrating for our volunteers because they really want to get out and help us. And when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? And, and we just, we're, we just have to explain there's a process that nobody sees except, you know, the city and us um, until we're able to. So we try to do little little steps where people see the construction fence happening so that way everybody can get the excitement kind of going with that momentum behind the scenes. I'm also glad you mentioned volunteers because uh, I'm sure once uh, once word gets out that there's a habitat property in the, the city, there'll probably be interest in 
uh, in the community for people to volunteer. How does that work and how does somebody volunteer for Habitat? So Habitat kind of has two, two things that we do for the, um, the cities that we serve. And of course, Pomona Valley Habitat, we're one of 40 habitats in California. Um, we serve a 16 city service area, essentially from the 605 to the 15, the foothills to the 60. I'm very proud to be, um, I've lived in this area myself, to be able to serve in the area that I grew up, it, it makes me very proud. But um, volunteers, we, we do projects called a brush with kindness, where pe there's ongoing projects and people in need. So if anybody wants to volunteer, volunteer, just go to www.habitatpv.org and learn how to get involved. Um, we need people daily, once a month, whatever you can volunteer, we'll find something for you to do. But again, this particular project, if, you, if you're gung-ho and it's got to be, you know, San Dimas first in Monta Vista, it's going to be a minute. Um, before we have people on site, but um, we need you to help fundraise. We need we need other p things to happen. So um, just get in touch with us. We'll we'll make sure that there's something for you to do. Great, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Any, qu any further questions? Okay, thank you. Well, thank you again for this blessing to the community and for all of your work. And sincerely look forward to the partnership and expanding what we do in the city of San Dimas. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Lily. Thank you. All right, this is a uh, public hearing. Uh, thank you, Lily. This is a public hearing, so we'll open a public hearing. Madam Clerk, is there any uh, speakers? No speaker cards have been turned in for this item. Is there anyone in the audience who w would wish to speak uh, t to this matter? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for deliberation. Any further questions? Any, any questions? I think it's a great project and if there's no comments, I would move approval. I'd second that with the comment that uh, it's an affordable house, it's in a single family neighborhood. It adds to the neighborhood and benefits somebody who, uh, who would need the, a house at, at this price and, and the way it works is really a, a great, great thing that the Habitat does. Thank you. Ryan, Eric, nothing. Okay. We have a motion, uh, all approve. Aye. 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 Any nays? Hearing none, build a house. <laughs> I got a feeling that somebody's gonna be very, very happy. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna to move to uh, item number two. A joint public hearing, city council and successor agency, consideration of resolution 2022-53, approving the disposition and development agreement and a covenant agreement with Pioneer Square, LLC, for the sale and development of a mixed use project at properties located at 344 West Bonita, APN 8386-021, dash 913 in San Dimas, California. This, can, this matter is continued from the October 11th, uh, 2022 meeting. And Mr. Mayor, once again, I will be recusing myself because, a property, because of a property conflict and we'll uh, watch the proceedings in the side room. So good luck to all of you and to all of you. And we'll see you uh, afterwards. Yeah. As John said, he's recusing himself because this matter it is the located near a property he owns. This public hearing item is continua a continuation from the October 11th, 2022 meeting. As there are changes proposed in the agreement providing in this agenda, we will reopen the public hearing in order to take public comment at the latest, on the latest version of this agreement. Chris Constantine, city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On October 11, 2022, the City Council heard an extensive report from city staff, including the City Attorney's Office and the City's consultant, Cosmont Realty. At this meeting, the City Council opened a public hearing, heard testimony from multiple individuals, and provided Pioneer Square LLC representatives the opportunity to both speak and respond to public comments. During the meeting, Pioneer Square representatives proposed a modification of the Disposition and Development Agreement to provide for a repurchase option 
and nine months in the case Pioneer Square was unable to provide the full financial commitments and partnerships required to secure the project. This proposal was made partially to address concerns raised by the City team related to the lack of executed agreements obligating key partners supporting the financing and hotel component of the project, one of the significant risks identified by the City team. The City Council acted to continue the meeting until tonight to allow the City team to work through the proposed modification. As with any development project that is complex, involves many aspects that are negotiated and is designed in a way that balances the need of the developer with the city's desire for a specific project, there is risk. There are risks involved in, a, in such a development and such of the key risks were included in the October 11th staff report, which is included as attachment two to this agenda item. This project has evolved and reflects changes necessary for the developer to finance the project as well as to limit cost and upfront commitment of substantial capital investment. Further, the developer's changes and resulting shortened time frame prior to the Surplus Land Act deadline have resulted in deferring many project elements to the City's traditional development process after the sale of the property. We should be clear, this is Pioneer Square's project, which the City staff have facilitated in negotiating changes based on City desires and concerns. However, with any complex project, not all City desires and concerns can be addressed and is a consideration for the City Council on whether they approve the project. Change and resulting negotiation on an agreement has risk that the contemplated project may further evolve from what was proposed or changed from preliminarily approved. And this is evident in the new concepts that Pioneer Square has, develop, has been developing as recent as the week before the last Council meeting and I suspect will continue into the next year. This is a risk that exists However, it is not atypical that such change can occur in this type of ground up development. Given the timeline and limitations of completing this project prior to triggering the Surplus Land Act process and gaining agreement with the developer, the City has reduced control over several aspects that it would otherwise have if the project had gone through entitlements prior to property sale. In the agreements presented on October 11th, such loss of control included control over the design concept, ultimate number of residential units, parking structure, property configuration, and how the project integrates with Pioneer Park. Further, the city team highlighted significant concerns that key partners, including Zislis and Republic Metropolitan, have, been, have not been contractually obligated to the project and further updated and recent financial and project viability information was not available in time to adequately allow Cosmont Realty to analyze and provide professional guidance to the city. Since the October 11th meeting, the city team has worked with Pioneer Square to evaluate the repurchase option. As related previously, two key partners, Zislis and Republic Metropolitan, had established teaming agreements with Pioneer Square but Pioneer Square had not executed operating agreements which made material commitments between the partners and the project. Specifically, Pioneer Square reported that the key partners required time to perform their due diligence after the approval of the disposition and development agreement, which would push the timeline past the December 31st, 2022 deadline, which would convert this project from a, an exclusively negotiated to a surplus land act transaction. At the October 11th city council meeting, Pioneer Square proposed offering a city a purchase option valued at the same price the property would be sold to Pioneer Square, uh, uh, approximately 2.6 million, which is the appraised value minus the estimated cost of environmental remediation and certain other required capital improvements. This concept would give the city the ability to sell the property prior to the December 31st deadline before triggering the Surplus Land Act. However, the risk reward trade-off here would be to continue the potential development past the Surplus Land Act, but now introduces a financial obligation to the city to secure the project with key partners, which should have been solidified prior to this point. Consequently, Pioneer Square's concept reduces risk associated with establishing viable project partners, but increases financial risk to the city, and at this point appears to be a financial risk to the city's general fund. To reduce risk to the city related to this new options financial risk, the city proposed an amendment which allowed the city to repurchase the property at a lower amount should an appraisal find that the value of the property minus the reductions described before fall between now and the point at which the city exercises its purchase option. This would secure the city from real estate market risk. Further, the city proposed as a condition of considering this new Pioneer Square option 
two additional amendments which would enhance the city's security that one, the hotel component would not be delayed or negatively impacted by development of the rest of the property, and two, requiring Pioneer Square to submit more details related to the project concept, including but not limited to project design and architectural components with its zoning application. The zoning application would provide the city the ability to have a stronger say in how the final project is developed since the zoning approval is discretionary. In total, Pioneer Square's concept opened the door to reduce risk in two other areas as well, completing a hotel as a priority and having say over concept property design, which were both key considerations which resulted in the city selecting Pioneer Square for this project. City staff have negotiated as best as possible to reduce risk, but this is Pioneer Square's project and reflects a compromise in what the city originally desired. The ambiguity for the ultimate final project and risk discussed during this and the previous public hearing item are considerations the City Council needs to weigh in its risk reward calculus. We appreciate all the hard work performed on both the City and Pioneer Square's teams. And now I turn it back to the City Council for any clar clarifying questions and to open the public hearing. Any questions of staff? None of staff, but of the developer? Um, would that take place? No, we'll, we'll, after we open okay, the public hearing. Okay. okay, we'll uh, open up, reopen the public hearing. Ask Mr. Deaton if you'd like to say a few words. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, Honorable Council Members, staff, members of the public, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here before you tonight. Um, uh, we are here with our Council, Andy uh, Brady, if you, if you have questions of him. Uh, Michael Zislis is here, the hotel operator, and PSQ's partner, uh, Jerry Tessier from Artico Partners. Um, we don't have anything to say other than uh, I think the uh, city manager's staff report explained exactly what we agreed to and uh, and we don't have any further comment on it. We are here to 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 address your your questions and uh, and uh, you can talk to Mr. Zislis about the hotel proposal that he that he has presented and uh, and Mr. Tessier as well. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions of Mr. Deaton at this time? I do. Good evening, Mr. Deaton. I had a question from a resident who has disabilities, and she wanted to know if you could talk a bit about how you will make the property accessible to people with disabilities, um, and, and if you could maybe go into details of the design and other elements that would make it a welcoming place for people with disabilities. Uh, Thank you, Council Member. Uh, excellent question. Um, <clears throat> we're particularly sensitive to this issue regarding making the project uh, a, a completely ADA, even over and above ADA standards and to make it very easy and accessible to, to people uh, uh, with disabilities. Um, uh, one of our partners, uh, Jerry's brother Ed, is a quadriplegic, and uh, and so we're uh, particularly sensitive about this, and and, uh, and we'll make it uh, a, um, a, a a a trophy is not the right adjective, but uh, an example of how best to uh, create a project as complicated as this with that it's terraced and so forth to, to make it uh, a, a model accessible project. Thank you. Any further questions? I had a question for the hotel operator. Uh, is, I wondered, as, we, as we're looking at the economic climate and potentially it could be an impact to travel, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how the hotel may weather um, changes in climate, changes in travel spending, 
to ensure that it is durable uh, in the city for the long term. Okay. That's me. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Michael Zislis. I'm the operator of the ho owner operator of the hotel. You know, you go back in time, uh, 19 years ago when I opened Shade Manhattan Beach on public land like this. You know, I, we were able to do a deal with the city, a 75-year long-term lease. Uh, in my original business plan, I had $175 a night, and I think my current ADR is $595. Uh, one of the strange things of COVID is this. Uh, it's been a big inflationary situation. And so what's happened now is uh, I thought we'd really be suffering after COVID, you know, a year ago. And all I've seen is the highest occupancies I've ever had. So I think people are maybe not traveling overseas as much and they're traveling more domestically. And we designed the hotel more about being a, a vacation spot, a weekend spot, place to have a wedding and event and those those things don't stop you know weddings don't go away they, they go away when you don't you're not allowed to have them but since covid's over you know we usually do about 30 weddings a year at shade redondo last year we did 90 because that was a pent-up demand for weddings so i just think you know if you build the right product in the right location it's always going to be busy and as far as ADA goes, we're very ADA compliant. We have uh, special rooms with, when you ring the doorbell, the lights blink in the room in case they have an audible. The beds are set up that they can roll up to them and get onto them if they're in a wheelchair. So we do everything right. Because there's, believe it or not, there's a lot of people who travel that are handicapped. Any other questions of me? Just for clarity, uh for people that may not know, when you say you're the owner of the hotel, you mean a hotel, but not a hotel because there is not a financial commitment or realization of one yet in this project, correct? Well, I've invested my own money in designing it, lawyer, you know, doing all the documents. So I've, I've probably got a couple hundred thousand into it already. I've offered to purchase the land with them to be a partner in the land. You know, to me, it's a great project. And usually I have to lease them from the city for 75 years. But this time I've got an opportunity to buy it. And you only want to buy what you believe in. And I believe in it. Thank you. Any so, further? I, I do. Um, some residents have expressed concerns about the traffic that the hotel would bring to downtown. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your relationships with residents who live near your current hotel and what you do to ensure that impact from traffic and travelers is minimal? Well, I don't know that I do that because the whole downtown wants me to be busy so that it spills into the downtown. So people that come to stay at the hotel shop in the downtown, they go to the supermarket to buy their food, maybe some sodas or beverages for their room. So to me, it's an economic driver. Uh, if I've ever had a, a city, I did have a city issue with one neighbor in Manhattan Beach, a sound issue. We built some sound baffles on a ceiling. We put up a glass wall. I actually won an award from the Manhattan Beach City Council of like, best operator in the city for, and the gentleman gave me the award at City Hall. So it was really great. So, you know, if you do have a problem, you, you address it and you fix it as fast as you can. There's no, nothing good about having somebody unhappy with you. And then I have a final question, not for the hotel, but more for the food court. Uh, I know that I, as well as perhaps other members of city council, have expressed some concerns about the food court since there are a lot of those in the area. And we wondered if you could talk a little bit about why you believe it would be successful, given that there are other food courts like the Glendora Public Market and other spaces that look pretty similar. Because I. I'll just speak only, I'll let him speak too, but I own food, I don't call them food courts. Food courts, what you see at the mall, these are food halls. Food you halls. Know? So these are independent, you know, different flavors from different parts of the world, sure. different beers, different wines, just they're incredible. So you want the family to go out, the kids all want a cheeseburger from the little Johnny Rockets type of place, but the adults want sushi at a sushi bar. I mean, it's just, it's something for everybody. And I just think it's the future. So that's my opinion, because I own a couple. <laughs> I have an opinion too because I own a couple. Um, I, you know, I think uh, I think there's a market for uh, communal food hall in almost every city, and I think you'll probably eventually see. We're planning one in Claremont. I think you'll probably see one in Laverne. You'll probably see one in downtown Pomona, where we also own property. And I don't think that's going to drive business away from a future location here in San Dimas. Um, I, I like some of the. 
um, operations at some of the food offerings at the Glendora Food Market, uh, the food hall, a public Glendora Public Market, right? Um, but I also think it wasn't executed quite right, and the configuration's good. I mean, I have some, I've seen some turnover there, and I think I know why, and I've actually talked to at least one of the operators that was there. Um, so I think the either success or lack of a success there isn't an indicator of how it will succeed. Um, you know, you know, three miles away or something. I, th I think it was like an eight minute drive, I think, between between this site and that location. I remember thinking the same thing. Is this gonna be competitive? How big is this gonna be? I really don't see it as a competitor because I don't think it's a particularly good example of what to do. Thank you, could I get the hotel operator back up, please? We're, we're talking about the food hall. Tell me about the restaurants in the hotel. I keep hearing we got a restaurant at the top, and then I hear some fine dining place inside. I, I but I'm them. not feeling very comfortable with those things. Uh, what we have is we have one kitchen. You know, labor's an issue everywhere, and in the restaurants as well. So you need a kitchen that can provide food for banquets, weddings, those type of events. Then we have, you know, in the morning you want your breakfast in your hotel, so we, it services that and it services lunch for meetings and, and things like that. But up on the roof, there is a, a bar with food which comes from that lower kitchen. So at night it's quite a scene to sit up on a rooftop and have a cocktail and look at these beautiful views of the mountains and uh, have some appetizers. So that's what it is. It's all out of one kitchen. All out of one kitchen. But yeah. So there's no fine dining restaurant at the in the downstairs area well i would like to call it fine dining but it's not fine dining i mean what i own some very fine dining michelin star restaurants it's not that it's very good food if you look at the menu at shade you can get a beautiful burger you can get some pizza but you can also get crispy ahi you know tuna on crispy rice and you can get poke bowls so there's there's something for everybody but uh you know we don't have tablecloths we do have a uh, cloth napkins so it's a step up but uh, fine dining, kind of, the, that term scares me a little bit. Okay. Um, one additional question. Uh, the size of the hotel, and when you say, talk about receptions and weddings and stuff, what would be the s approximate size or the, the amount of people you could have at, at a, say, a wedding? What's going to be the size of the room? About 150 people. About 100. So the, the hotel has 70, about 75 rooms, and we figure, you know. About 75 what? rooms okay and uh, that's boutique you know you, you want to kind of stay at that threshold of 75 rooms where you know the guest name when they come in hey mr thompson thanks for coming back and then as far as weddings go it's not the uh you know the big hall where the big three four hundred person weddings are it's a 150 person wedding it's the perfect size okay thank you you're welcome can you talk really quickly about the uh, the parking situation for the hotel? I know uh, yeah. the, the valet thing has come up uh, to the council a few times from members of the community and wondering whether a valet-only hotel would, would work uh, in a community like ours, which we don't traditionally have anything that anything at all, I don't think, that has uh, valet. Well, and, the, va uh, the valet is also the, the bell captain, you know, the bellman. It's a combined job in a boutique hotel, so that person's on salary anyway. So we've just found it always nicer to park their cars. We let them park them if they want themselves. It goes into our space. And there's, a, there's a really no fee difference. I do know during COVID, we didn't do any valet parking because nobody wanted anybody in their car. So we got away from it and we just started it back up about seven months ago. And, uh, but again, those people have like three functions actually. So they're, <coughs> they uh, bring the bags to the room, they uh, get guest things, bring things to the room, park their cars, and then they sweep up around the outside when the wind blows and bags fly, fly by. All right. You brought up that word fee. Um, not knowing what your fee is or anything like that, but um, we're, there's a retail area within the, the, pro, the project. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know if the fee is there going to be a fee for people parking in that going to the retail area? No. Okay. There. I, I would Do you say, know or are you just saying no? I, I don't, I've never seen a parking meter or anything. He can speak to that. But all I know is that our Metlocks uh, at, at the city of Manhattan Beach, 
they can park for a quarter or whatever it is, an hour down there, or they can valet with me for $15. And a lot of people just choose to valet. They have a lot of bags, they have kids in tow, they don't wanna go down and park and walk back up. They just pull up to the valet. So we accommodate anybody that wants to park in our valet, but uh, it's, it's mostly for guests. Okay, but there's gonna be parking underneath in the parking structure for the retail side of the, the I'll, project. I'll let them speak to that. Okay, I, thank you. You're, just, just a question really quick on that point the mayor raises. I think in a previous presentation we were told the, there would be no fee for valeting a vehicle. So there will be a fee to valet a vehicle? You know, it's a market study for me. Uh, you know, you can either put it into the room rate or, or not. And I just something I have to decide. If it's a big issue, that, you know, I can surely put it in the room rate. But I, I don't think uh, we, like, like I said, it, at the hotel they can park for free if they want to park the car themselves so they valet for $15 and I think they all choose the valet. And if they self park and the way the configuration is unique to this parking situation then you'd be comfortable with people self parking in tandem parking? I do like I said I did it all through COVID and I had no problems. So we oh, just gave you know the key card like we do it at Shade Redondo we have a key card when you check in and then the lot has an arm on it and they put the thing up but the, also the valets have a master key that lets the arm in so. So if a, if a visitor parked their car and somebody parked behind them, how do you uh, solve that problem? We would only do the valet in tandem. I see. So anyone... Or the employees. You know, a lot of time we do employee parking in tandem because then you can call somebody and they know who's who to move the car. So if somebody want, if, a, if a visitor wanted to self-park, then You'd they would a single use spot. a single spot? Yeah. It's my understanding all parking's in tandem for this project, is it not? Is it dedicated to the hotel? Is that correct, Chris? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the retail and commercial uses of the project will not charge for parking. Uh, th that will all be free. Um, and, and your question is, uh, the, the garage is in, uh, uh, we have a conceptual plan for the garage and, and then when we're, if we're approved tonight, we will go forward with staff and begin uh, finalizing our, our entitlement package. And at that time, we'll have uh, the garage completely uh, planned and, and for planning staff to review it with us so, so it meets all of the code requirements here for the city. If, uh, what's the parking uh, that's allocated for the hotel at this point? Uh, um, the way that, that we set it up is that the hotel has its own entry down in the garage. It's very similar to the Metlocks uh, down in Manhattan Beach, which I was a partner in. And um, Mr. Zislas will be operating that separately. But, but numbers wise. Uh, par pardon? What was the, the staff know what the number was for parking spaces for uh, the hotel I use? I don't know. Uh, uh, 45 spaces, yep, yep. Four, 45 and, and, tandem and, spaces. And, and, and you know, for example, when, when the hotel has special events uh, or they're completely full and, and, and they need additional parking, we will, we will accommodate them over at the, at, the, at the public part of the garage as well. Okay. And, so. and it, it may be also that, that we have to have uh, uh, that parking tended during special events like a wedding or a holiday, special holidays, uh, Christmas season and so forth. And the, go ahead, Chris. I, I just wanted to speak to the question you asked about tandem parking. In the, D, in the development agreement under page 376, hotel guests and visitors are to be parked in a three tandem space only valet garage managed by the hotel operator. Right, so in the, in the event of either self parking or another pandemic or something, where people don't want to valet, I mean, sorry, they want to, yeah, they don't want to valet, they want to self-park. If we're only doing one space per, you're going to have bleed over that's going to go in, presumably either to your garage or spill out into the community is, I guess, the point, so. Yeah, go ahead. You know, if you go downtown Los Angeles and park in a building, they have tandem spots and they have one person down there that keeps the keys, that's what would, that's what we'd have to go to. One. The parking situation in downtown sucks. It does. But I'm just telling you, if, if God forbid we have another COVID situation, that's what we're going to have to do. I understood. All right. Okay. Thank you. 
You know, um, more questions? Yeah, I just back to the uh, the parking issue. Like you said, God forbid we have another COVID. But at the end of the day, if I am inconsiderate and I go down to the shopping to shop and I pull my car up behind some other car and I take off, okay, because under the self parking rule, okay, what if that guy in front of me wants to get out and I've now left my keys? <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't leave my keys with the, the attendant, which you're basically telling me you have a 24 hour attempt, attendant, right? Am I missing this? Um, no, uh, uh, Jerry, do you want to do you want to address this about the parking? Uh, the retail doesn't have to. Uh, the, the retail wouldn't be 24/7, so you wouldn't need a parking attendant to account for retail 24/7. And we we work on a lot of projects where you have an attendant at the exit during all operating hours, and the attendant will collect keys from people. Um, so you know, uh, it, we don't think it's there, it will be common at all to encounter an occurrence where someone, you know, refuses their give, to give their keys to an attendant who's asking for the keys. Okay, but mm. Mm. Uh, let's hope that we're blessed and the hotel becomes full. Okay, and I decide to take my wife down there to go have dinner on the roof. Okay, probably not going to park at the hotel, probably going to park in the retail area and, uh, and then go on upstairs. So I'm just, I'm worried about this retail thing and saying it's not gonna be 24 seven because, you know, my bride might wanna stay out there till one o'clock in the morning. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's no tandem in retail. Uh, 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 Jerry informs me that there's, that there's no tandem on, on the retail. And, and, and once again, the, the, uh, the final parking garage is, is not, uh, 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 schematically drawn yet and that will be part of our application for our entitlement and it will be approved by the by by your your city staff thank you uh, let me let me just you, ask you know, a quick question you know, so you'll have you'll have uh, plenty of opportunity when we come in for entitlements for you to critique the garage and, and we'll have you know it laid out and, and put up and, and you'll see exactly how it's going to function and, okay. and and accommodate all all the different uses it's it's complicated with a mixed use project like this uh, uh, to to fine-tune the parking without you know a professional parking company to come in and and uh, help us with all that and, okay. thank thank you uh, mr. Tessier thank you very much Henry I was under the impression, and I don't know if anybody else was, that all the parking within this, this project was tandem. Do you have something different to say that retail is retail's not going to be tandem? It was, always, it was always staff's understanding that the hotel was going to be valet. Um, there might have been a tandem proposal previously for the residential but the retail was never tandem as far as we were understanding. Okay. It was just the hotel component and that went from potentially two to possibly three at some point, but these are all conceptual. But isn't the residential tandem? The last reiteration that we saw previously a few months ago was there was a potential for tandem for residential, correct? Mm. Okay. And, and just so I, I re recall the facts correctly, but the the original number for parking that the city originally uh, proposed was uh, changed or otherwise deviated from to an agreed upon number, but that agreed upon number still is not sufficient to be able to adequately park all of both the residents, the commercial, and the hotel uh, at peak capacity, right? For peak capacity, we haven't studied the peak capacity. Uh, we, as staff, uh, we worked with the, the developer and we researched as much as possible, um, mixed use development and parking standards. Um, and that's how we came up with uh, an agreed upon ratio to propose to the, the council. But if, a, I guess if, a, if like the mayor alluded to, if a 
another pandemic or crisis hit or whatever, and we went down to people not using valet and they're single parking all the spaces in the hotel, that's going to eat up commercial space that otherwise would have been allocated for commercial space, which means that the project, the project can't park, right? I would have to ask the hotel operator. Um, I believe what they said during the pandemic, they were self-parking, but they were providing the keys for tandem spaces. Yeah, but I'm um, council member, you know, in that particular scenario, you'd probably have commercial business close if we have another pandemic to the point where, you know, you don't want to have someone in your car to valet it. So I, I, I don't think we can plan a parking strategy or a development around the next, next pandemic. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. And I have just one more question. And this is probably not even a question that anybody um, would you be planning on at this time because they'll be working with the staff and everything. But I keep hearing the governor say that he signed a, 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 uh, an order that says we're going to have all electric vehicles by 1930 or 2035 or 2090 or something like that. But long story short, if we're going to do tandem parking, uh, how do we accommodate? And this is just a a curiosity question, okay? <laughs> how do we, how do we, what do we think we'd do with that? What's that gonna look like? Well, well, first of all, we will have uh, uh, charging stations for, for electric vehicles, uh, um, uh, both for the residential and the commercial. Uh, and, and, and I'm not sure I understood the, the second part of your question. Okay, uh, if we're all gonna, at some point, the, the, the belief is that we will do away with gas-propelled cars, diesel-propelled cars. We'll have nothing but right. electricity. So if I have a tandem, tandem lot, I know that I can switch out, charge my one, pull forward, and things like that. But wh where would these be? And it's just a curiosity question. It's got, I don't expect you to have a real answer, <laughs> so to tell you the truth. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, maybe I should have been a baseball player and, and, and not a developer. It, it, it's, well, uh, yeah, know, but I, you, I like the way that he was treated, you know. Yeah, but, he, but anyway, Mr. Mayor. Uh, um, I think you better let Mr. Tessiter answer this question. He seems okay. like he's ready. All right. All right. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, so there's no reason that you can't have a charging in a tandem space. You know, there's different kinds of chargers. There's level one, level two, level three. You may be thinking of like the big charging stations, like the giant Tesla things that are public charging stations. A lot of charging, like I do at my house, you're just plugging into a 50 amp circuit with a, with a, you know, with, you know, like appliance plug basically. And that's an overnight charge. You know, typically if you're like for the hotel, you don't need the rapid chargers because people are generally charging over night when they're a hotel guest. So uh, Tandem would not preclude eventually going to 100% charging capacity in the entire in the entire project. Super, thank you. You're welcome. All right, any <coughs> further questions from the developer? Okay, we'll open a public hearing to anyone at wishing to speak. Do we have any cards? First speaker is Andrea Messenger. Um, thank you, and um, I, I'm Andrea Messenger, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I've actually kind of changed what I'm going to say because just in listening to the presentation, I wish we had more time to actually think about this project. Um, I do not want to see housing go in in that area. I've been in San Dimas for 30 years. San Dimas is not the place it used to be. Downtown San Dimas tonight, my husband and I went down to downtown Glendora. Why? Because it's got darling restaurants and it's got darling, quaint, trendy shops. And they've got this housing area with, or just, you know, small housing area with trees and everything. We would come to San Dimas, but there's not that much here. I do like what's happened to San Dimas Avenue. So actually, I was originally going to be in favor of this. I don't know if I am. I think there's just some unanswered questions. I don't want to run into it. But just here, as, as somebody who votes and loves my city and raised our kids here, and 
we can't let it, we can't just build more housing in that area. We've got to develop it to bring people. We're going to have the Olympics, for goodness sakes. They're going to be at Benelli Park. We, we, we should have a trendy area where people want to eat and shop, and we're bringing in tax dollars. I mean, again, I live in San Dimas, but we go towards Glendora or we go towards Claremont because we just don't see very much here. Anyway, I don't know how you should vote. You have to vote your conscience. I just hope that what we do develop will benefit the city and draw people to the community because I want to read this quote by uh, Ed McMahon. It says this, it's really kind of hard to be a suburb of nothing. If you don't have a downtown, you really don't have anything. It's hard to build a community around parking lots and subdivisions. And so I, I just want to take my po point here to say I'm not sure how you should vote. But I honestly feel that this downtown has got to be rethought out so that people want to come here, that this is a trendy draw for people, so that we're not going to other places to spend our money, but that we're coming here. And then we keep the antique shops in business, and then we keep Ace Hardware in business. So anyway, Andrea Messenger, I love San Dimas. Wasn't anything what I was going to say, but um, I hope you guys make the right decision and do what's best for building community that comes here. Thank you. Ray Raymond McDonald. <clears throat> Raymond McDonald, I live a half a block away from this proposed project. A um, few new things I want to add. Um, first, I want to say thanks to all parties involved for the iterative process that has brought us here, for the step-by-step -step changes that I hope make people more comfortable. I think we were on that road until we started what ifing to the point that it started to generate fear. Now, my job wasn't planning cities. I was mayor of a small military town for a small period, and I was a brigade planner planning war for 3,900 to 4,200 people. You can't get rid of all risk, and there is a risk involved in the do nothing option as well, and we've heard some of our concerns about that. And I'm concerned that will accelerate what we already see as increasing crime, graffiti, homelessness, etc. I'm here in support of PSQ because I too support it as support San Dimas and the vision of it as being a great place to work, play, live. I'm standing here now, used to an amount of pain that would probably make a lot of people shudder. To answer your question about disabilities, some days I can't walk. Some days I can't get in the car to go somewhere. That has a tremendous impact on my wife and kid. I would like some place close that my kid could go to or my wife would go to. I'm not the only one. I have neighbors that are seniors that likewise need some place close. I have neighbors with kids. You go there during the day. Some of you have been there during the day and you see the strollers and all the activity around the park. If you go over to Azusa or some of the other neighborhoods, you go there on a weeknight and you see the local money. You see the places full and bustling. And that's what we can have here. A good place to work, play, and live. There's no sense of where we're going to be with plug-in chargers. We know we can do it now, but Moore's Law says that technology is going to double in terms of its improvement every 18 months. What I appreciated, I like that you caught him on it, and he said, my, and it's not a done deal yet. I get that. But it does show a level of ownership, that owner-operator, that flexibility, that not building something and leaving, but building something that is actually going to be here. If we're looking at which character we are in The Wizard of Oz, where's the heart of San Dimas right now? It's here in this meeting and a vision of something that we can achieve. I was really glad to hear about a 750 square foot home that will go to a, a veteran and their family in need. I was really glad when I was in school and right before I had my first cancer surgery, I was able to come here and I knew I wanted to stay in the BUSD and get a 640 square foot home built in 1942. And I said, this is the place where we can get old. The only thing we might have to do is grind down that one step and turn it into a ramp someday. And then I'll be able to go, God willing, half a block to local businesses like Romans and stuff 
And like you might remember I said at the beginning, take my wife out, that my kid can fulfill the dream of coming back and teaching at Bonita High School, where they're a senior. So that's the vision here, and I'm just looking for the heart. We've done a lot of good work here, but let's not try to get a false sense of precision for a 0.01% where now all we've done is generate fear, but we haven't really. There's, there's nothing there. There's no there there. We're pretty much at a point where we gotta decide. What is the legacy? What is the future of this city? And I believe it's either green or brown. You know the area we've talked that I grew up in. Highland Park and Eagle Rock. I didn't come here to grow up in another Highland Park. I walked away from a house that I could have inherited because the first sign language I learned was not ASL. So we've got a great thing here with our schools. We've got a great thing here with the parks near the schools. But man, it's about as dead as when I lived in Iowa. And that's just not okay as a suburb of LA. I like the way you said that. We can't be a suburb of nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Kay Sheed. Good evening, Mayor Bedar, council members and neighbors. My name is Mary Kay Scheid, and um, I wanted to share with you some thoughts. It seems like a lot of my neighbors have more understanding of what's going on than perhaps I do, but I'm happy to live in such a beautiful place. Um, much of the year, we can be outside and that's a lovely thing for someone who grew up in the Midwest. And I believe that we do need a place like Pioneer Square. Um, I thank you for your thoughtful questions, and I do believe that there are probably questions that need to be answered, but it's possible that we won't have the answers until halfway through. Uh, I want to let you know that our only bookstore in San Dimas closed like, whatever, 10, 15 years ago. Um, the thought of having a place like Romans that I could walk to is amazing. I was so, so, so disappointed when the restaurant at the Walker House closed. It was a beautiful place. It was a beautiful venue. Um, I go to Claremont, and I go to Laverne. Um, and uh, I believe that those places have rich and vibrant places for me to visit, uh, the Packing House in Claremont, Old Town Square near the University of Laverne. I believe that we need something like that here. And I will leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Aaron Wang. I apologize. Um, I'm not Aaron. My name is Corey Pope. I'm the neighbor of Aaron who just left to put his child to sleep while his wife works as a nurse. Um, but he prepared some words to share. Um, dear members of the, of the city council and city staff, I sincerely thank you all for your prudence and due diligence regarding this project. I think you've all done a terrific job in mitigating risk to the city, both with regards to finances and project completion. It has not gone unnoticed here now to express my support in moving forward with this DDA uh, proposal. As you all know, the city is in the middle of a community outreach and surveying for the downtown specific plan. Uh, I, I, excuse me, I highly doubt anybody has responded saying, hey, what downtown really needs is more affordable housing. <laughs> uh, for what I understand, what the community is saying they want is more things to do, more places to eat, more places, more areas to hang out and enjoy themselves. And I think this is a great opportunity for that. It's time to move forward. Let's not tease the possibility of alternative and let's not wait for the surplus land act clauses to kick in. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I would add too, um, I work in the, the architecture and, uh, and construction industry. Um, I'm fully aware of the surplus land act and what's to come with affordable housing. Um, what I'm hearing from the community is we want uh, good development for the community with retail, 
um, and amenities. What we will see if we wait in a month and a half um, after December 31st is developers will come with their affordable uh, housing performers and will be truly based off of finances. Um, you'll see much denser housing with much, less, uh, much fewer parking. Um, current code and projected code for the state of California allows for half a car per unit or no cars per units if you're doing a, uh, a transit-oriented community, which this project uh, is applicable for. So I, I, I personally want to express my um, support of this project. I think it's a great fit for this community. Um, it matches a lot of the great development that's going on in other cities around us, like uh, Claremont, Pomona, even Azusa now. I just moved from Azusa um, to, to the city of San Diego. So um, again, I think we have a bright horizon with this project. I would highly encourage everybody, everybody to accept that moving forward, knowing that a lot of the things aren't solved tonight uh, and the great team uh, in front of you We'll work with you collaboratively to solve those problems. So thank you. Thank you. Those, those are all the speaker cards, Mayor. Anyone else wishing to uh, speak to the council concerning this? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I was going to give uh, my perspective on the, the PSQ, but that gentleman right there, I think, perfectly said it for all of us. Uh, in fact, I think he mentioned the heart of San Dimas. I think what he expressed was the heart of San Dimas. We need something like that to bring us together. And I think PSQ is, is going to do the job. So I'm going to defer to what he said, because that was perfect. That was spot on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kranzer. Hi, welcome you guys. I honestly haven't been here for the entire meeting, but I specifically drove here after my class because I wanted to speak on this. You guys have been humming and hawing over this for so long. I am so sick of us kind of dragging this on. We need to move forward with this. Our, what you said apparently was really good, so I'm gonna second whatever he said. But, you know, I've been to a lot of little towns and communities in other states. You know how many times I go in and I'm like, wow, what a great little town this is. It has a lot of his history to it. It has places you can go to, you can eat, you can hang out, and you feel the community there. I want that for our town. I've been living here for 10 years. We don't have anywhere downtown. When I take my kids, you know what the kids say? Can we go see the cats in the window? There is nowhere to come down here to hang out, okay? We can't come down, get an ice cream, we gotta go to 31 Flavors, and then we have to come back this way to sit at the park in front of the railroad station to sit and enjoy. I'd love to have a place to come on the weekend where we can hang out as a family, ride our bikes down here, and spend time together. This city needs it. Like they said, there are so many communities around us that are building up and doing that, and I don't like to have to go to another community, and I don't wanna spend my money there. I wanna be here. I wanna ride my bike from home downtown and have community here in our town. Please, can we move forward on this? Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to the council concerning this matter? I'm not going to be so rosy because I'm really concerned about the fact that there are some of you who are still on the fence about this project and I just don't get it. I think it would be a huge mistake if the city does not go forward and approve this project. It has a potential to improve San Dimas moving into the future with style. It will be a great loss if we miss this wonderful opportunity. If you allow this property to trigger the Surplus Land Act and we end up with low income housing all along Bonita, it will be a travesty for the city. PSQ is a well thought out, high quality project. If there are those of you who think the city could sell this property before December 31st, what would it be but a hastily thrown together project. 
it certainly would not be anywhere near the caliber of this project. Last meeting, the mayor suggested perhaps a park. I can tell you that the same people who are afraid our town will be overrun by the homeless because of the gold line, they're going to be the same folks who will be screaming bloody murder that the park will be ju just become another place for the homeless to take over. And it's also my understanding that it would be up to the city to deal with the environmental cleanup, which would be lots of money. What do you want your legacy to be? That you boldly chose to move our city forward or that you failed to act out of fear and let downtown lose its character and turn into rows of characterless low income housing? Are you seriously going to nix this project just because you can see you can't see beyond your fears over parking? There are plenty of creative solutions which can be implemented to deal with parking should it become an issue. I'm urging you to be brave and forward thinking. Please don't let our city down. We're counting on you to do the right thing. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to the council? Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Isabel Ebener, resident on West 4th Street. Um, I wasn't going to speak tonight because you've heard me talk about this like for the past four years, but um, I can hear Mr. Mayor, you're still on the fence. So. Um, you know, it sounds like the council is really concerned about the parking, the traffic impact. Um, I also wanted to address Ms. Messenger. Um, you know, I really believe that Pioneer Square is the trendy tax generating project that we need. Um, you know, as someone who has watched every single meeting about this, um, at this point, you know, I really think there are probably three options on the table because of the Surplus Land Act. Just to give you some background, um, if the city doesn't sell the property by December 31st, um, if we do decide to sell the property in the future, it has to be offered to low income affordable housing developers first. Um, so Surplus Land Act, the alternative option, which Ms. Bridgewater mentioned, Mr. Mayor, we talked about is maybe purchasing it as a park. Um, that's a kind of, uh, workaround from the Surplus Land Act. Um, you know, I love parks. I would be happy with a park. Um, the problem with a park is that it's going to cost money. It's, uh, you know, we have to buy the property from the redevelopment agency. We have to do the environmental cleanup. It's going to cost to maintain it. Um, the Pioneer Square project is tax generating. We're going to get the TOT tax in the, I think it was in the $700,000 a year that the city is wanting. Um, you know, we're going to get property taxes. We're going to get uh, retail taxes from, from all the shops. So, I mean, economically, Pioneer Square seems like a great project. Um, also, if Pioneer Square isn't approved and the, the city does decide to have this uh, land subject to the Surplus Land Act, as uh, Mr. Pope said, um, you know, San Dimas, I know we're trying to, we're nitpicking about how many parking spaces are going to be in PSQ. Uh, come January 1st, if that becomes low-income housing, we're not going to have any control about over how much parking ends up at that property. Maybe there will be no parking and just housing, 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 which is probably, uh, I think, most people's worst nightmare for that site. Um, so I truly believe that Pioneer Square is the best option for San Dimas. I'm going to go on the record again to say that I am in support of this project. Um, I also want to remind you of all the folks who came two weeks ago for this public hearing who spoke in favor, some who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, there's many people at home, too, who are not able to be here and who do support this project. So um, I hope that you remember us when you do your vote in hopefully five minutes, and uh, we hope you do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. 
Um, I was at home and I thought, well, I think I might as well come down. I actually thought we'd have more people here. But if we had people here two weeks ago and we still have people here and we have people at home, like myself, that was home listening and watching, um, we have so many people that are interested in this project. And for me, I always look at everything in a balance. I have been working on affordable housing for not only our city, but in other cities. And I'd love to see affordable housing, but I don't think this is the location. I don't think this is the location because I think we have a better suited project for that location. And I think Pioneer Square is it. Um, I echo everyone's sentiment. I drive over to Claremont. I eat in Claremont. I go on Friday night because they have multiple bands in multiple locations. I can take my girls over there and have things to do all night long. I can jump on the freeway. I can go to Pasadena. We have had leadership in this town that has spent the last 40 years keeping us a quiet little sleepy community which is great I love it it's one of the reasons I like to raise my kids here my kids won't live here they won't live here because what are they gonna do there's no jobs here it's very difficult on the weekend there's not that much social stuff going on um, even when they come to visit they want to go to Claremont or they want to go to Pasadena because what are we gonna do here we even had um, when we had the mansion open at night, we had mansion open on Friday nights and Saturday nights. We had the gallery open. We had the restaurant open. We had to be closed by a certain time. We had sound restrictions. We couldn't use the outside. Everything that's happened in the last 40 years has been to put a lid on the city. And we wanted to put a lid on the city because we wanted to keep crime down, which is great. We wanted to keep, you know, this is small town feel. Great. We have 600 million shops downtown that people come by because we're considered one of the quaint cities in a listing that of California cities, which is great. We, we need to have people come and we need to have people shop. But the quaintness of some of the commercial property that we have downtown or the beauty shops that we have downtown are not something that people utilize that much on the weekend. There's just not that much to do. When she said, okay, we can go have ice cream and then go down to the... <laughs> down to the train station okay that's great now we're all done now what do we do so we need this project we may not be here we may not get to utilize it as much as we would have liked to but at this point the lid is off I mean we are not going to be sleepy sand demons anymore we've got to find a balance in there we need affordable housing we need something to do on the weekend we need places for people to go eat the project if reminiscent of the one over in Claremont is a great fit for this city so I think I don't know why we're still talking about this let's move forward and try to bring some type of balance and some type of effort into making the community a progressive city that it's more than time to start doing. Thanks. Thank you. All right, anyone else wishing to speak to the council concerning this matter? Mr. Mayor, I just, want to, I just want to remind at the end just to give an opportunity to right. the developer. Hi, I'm Julie Henry. I, I spoke the last time, I, two weeks ago. Um, I don't have anything prepared, and I just really want to emphasize a couple of things. I don't know how many of you live in downtown San Dimas, but I do, and I've lived there for almost 33 years. And I moved here because I wanted to live in a town that was historic, and I live in a hundred, over 110-year-old home. Um, I raised my daughters here, and same sentiment she just said. There, there was. They wouldn't come back to live here because what is there to do here? All the time I was raising them up, we walked everywhere. We walked to the library, walked downtown, walked to the stores, all around. But at night, the sidewalks roll up. It was always the joke, you know, there's nothing to do here. So we would go to Claremont. We would go to Glendora. We would go always outside the city. But we have such a wonderful, historic, community-oriented. I work in the school district. I've worked there for 18 years. I work at the school my daughters went to such an opportunity to really enhance the community that we do have, because I think we do have that real sense. 
But when I say, I don't know how many of you live in the downtown area, I miss having the parade going down the San Dimas Avenue. I live on 2nd Street. I thought it was great there were cars parked all over my street. How wonderful to have all these people coming in to our town, coming into our downtown, to enjoy being together as a community and to help encourage sales at the local businesses. I was a member of the Historical Society. I am a member. I was on the board for many years. And, you know, how awesome we have the Walker House there. We have so much things that if this project could happen, could just really expand what we have and bring people back and make our downtown such a more vibrant, welcoming place for us to be. You know, I don't know how much longer we have to wait. You know, like, we've, we've all been here. We've been here from, I know I've been here from the beginning. And I feel like they have tried so hard to speak to us and find out what it is we're interested in, what is it that we want. I feel like they've been bending over backwards trying to please you as well. I know the city has worked really hard with them. There's just been so much energy given to this project. And I know the last time I was here, Mr. Vienna, you said, I'm so worried about letting my community members down. Well, I'm one of your community members. All of us that have been speaking in, in support of this project, I feel that if you don't move forward with something, this is such a wonderful opportunity. They've worked so hard. We've all been here supporting it. I know there's concerns, but we can work those things out. And I think that if you don't move forward with it, you will be letting us down. Yes. You yes. really will. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to, towards council considering this matter? Seeing none, we'll call up the uh, developer. Mr. Deaton, would you like to say anything additional? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I don't think we have anything to add. I, I just want to thank the community for coming out and, and, uh, and sharing their perspectives on, on, on this project. Uh, <clears throat> what we always... Uh, envisioned here just to summarize is that this uh pioneer square is the gateway the the western gateway to the downtown and uh, what we want to do is uh with the mix of uses there uh, to really energize that part of of, of the downtown uh, take advantage of the beautiful park to the south of us and uh, that's why we have residential there uh, for families that can have children and they can play carefully and safely out in the park. Um, we, we want it to be uh, a, uh, a, a, call it the living room of, uh, of, uh, of, of that side of the downtown and, and to give it the energy uh, going from west to east and it, it will contribute to the small businesses that are existing uh, that may be a little bit struggling and uh, there'll be people with resources that will be living here people that are going to be staying at the hotel or are going to spend money in the downtown at the shops and p people need to have their hair cut or hair done or whatever and uh, and to use all of those uh, those type of uses. So uh, it's in that spirit that that we designed this and presented it to you. And uh, I think the community uh, sees it that way. And, and we appreciate that. And we look forward to working with you if we're going to go forward. And you have a great, talented, smart staff here. And uh, I think we're going to build you a, a great project. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your consideration. Does anybody have a question for Mr. Deaton at this time? All right, we're going to bring it back to the council. This can close the public hearing. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, we had a one minor amendment to the covenant agreement that's in the packet that staff uh, in the city attorney's office is recommending tonight. So I wanted to uh, throw it over to my colleague, Fred Galante, to explain that. Mr. Right Galante. Now. Uh, good evening, council. Fred Galante with uh, the city attorney's firm. Uh, thank you. The, just a couple clarifications on the agreement, and I've already discussed this with the developer's legal counsel, and they're in full agreement. Essentially, uh, as a result of some of the pending leg legislation that is uh, facing every jurisdiction, 
we wanted to make sure that the parking obligations are uh, strictly complied with. That's al already covered very extensively in the DDA, the Disposition and Development Agreement. We want to, and this may be a little bit of uh, belt and suspenders, but we want to add into the covenant agreement a statement that will require the developer to comply with all development standards in the scope of development included in that disposition and development agreement, including the parking obligations. Uh, that way, all of the issues that this council heard tonight about parking uh, standards and, and the details will be incorporated in the project and that'll be part of the recorded document that is placed on the title of the property. And just finally, just a minor clarification, the resolution had the wrong um, acreage for the site. It should be 4.03 acres and that is correctly reflected in all the other documents, the staff report, the agreements that uh, we prepared. So I just wanted to highlight that for the record. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So as I understand, as we know, the state is moving in a direction to handle some of these parking issues. And uh, with this, this amendment will put us out of the harm of what the state's planning on doing. Is that uh, what th we're saying? Th that is correct. There are several pieces of legislation, one of which is uh, AB 2097. Um, and that is, pardon me, SB 2097, and that essentially allows developers to avoid some parking requirements if you're within half a mile of a transit stop, which this project would qualify for. And the amendment will cover that? Yeah, correct. You know, six months from now, seven months from now, when somebody decides they want to challenge it? That's correct. It will be part of the recorded document, even though it's in the disposition and development agreement that you're considering and potentially if you approve that that will be a binding agreement this like I said it's sort of belt and suspenders recording it okay. against the property thank you all right any anything else okay we'll bring it back to the council mr. Nakano or do, do we have any questions of anyone else out there of the staff of our staff I do have one question for the staff. I think one of the things that we brought up at the last meeting was the um, the two additional iterations of the project that were submitted, um, I guess not in time for us to evaluate in any uh, appreciable way. Uh, in the last couple of weeks since the last meeting, has there been uh, any analysis done on those two projects as far as whether they're feasible at all or, or uh, um, anything in regards to that? I'll ask Cosmo to speak to any evaluation they did. Uh, my understanding is we don't have all the information we'd be looking for, but I'll ask Larry to speak to that. Council, Larry Cosmo, Cosmo Companies, your real estate and finance advisor. We don't have the all the information we need, and we would like to. We just need more time for those uh, evaluation of those pro forma, and I think the part of the consideration, should you decide to move forward, is this additional built-in time with the amendments that we've made that would give us adequate and timely information uh, for us to appropriately evaluate them and keep you informed as to what our our opinion is of that information at that time. Okay. Well, how does that how does how does that play in the fact that? You know, probably five minutes we're going to make a vote. Okay, so t tell me about how that, if you need more time to evaluate what was going on, where do, how do we get there? Yeah, I, I, the, the way the transaction is structured now, you essentially have a period of time to, uh, you know, reacquire the property. And in this period of time, the developer will actually come up with much more significant financial information because we will also get the binding letters of commitment that go with those pro forma. I would just say to you that for us to get answers now on these pro forma, they'd be absent contractor estimates. They'd be devoid of absolute commitments by the funding parties. So it's really not an analysis that would just be adequate enough to truly move forward. I think at this point, you have the opportunity, if you want to take it, 
to move forward under an agreement circumstance that enables the city to backstop taking back the property or requiring it if the transaction details, including design, including economics, including binding commitments from the developer partners as proposed, don't materialize. That's a much more significant basis upon which to move forward. Thank you. In, in regards to an analysis, uh, was the, I guess, the not the, the two iterations of the project that were submitted uh, three weeks ago, uh, but the one prior to that, did, uh, did we have a chance to look over that in the way that we would prefer to look at the two new iterations? Or is that itself, because everything is still up in the air in regards to financing and, and commitments, is that kind of also in the same spot? It, we felt we had sufficient understanding and evaluation of those pro forma to indicate that the project had adequate returns and uh, reasonable conclusions and assumptions. Remember, the parking was moving around. So when we finally stabilized, and parking has a direct impact on cost, right? So which has a direct impact on return. So once that stabilized out in the sort of next or the last iteration before the two new iterations were introduced, I felt we felt comfortable that the project conclusions made sense to us. We also know, again, at that point, we were relying on the fact that we would get binding commitments by a time certain, which again, now based on the recommendations or based on the documentation you have now as modified, essentially pushes that equation into a fuller mode of evaluation because we've expanded the due diligence requirement by extending the time, which is essentially extended by our ability to uh, reacquire the property. So we have moved sort of the playing field, we've extended the playing field, but as of the time that you had wanted us to look at the transaction, we did, and we felt that the assumptions and the conclusions were reasonable based on the status of the project at the time. So I guess my final question for you would be, um, from the analysis at which, at which point we said, okay, we're, we, we think that this project makes sense and, and uh, you know, it pencils out, um, and then, it, that's the three versions ago. And then looking at that version, which was vetted, and then looking at the two new versions, um, I don't know that I know enough to say whether there's anything substantially changed in the project uh, that would lead me to believe that the analysis at some other point down the road would lead us to a different answer as to uh, the viability of it. So um, I, I guess, I'm asking for, for you to kind of give us your, your professional opinion um, as it relates to the, the three iterations of the project and how, how different they are in, in reality and, and whether you think that there is a, a substantial risk of the, the, the new iterations of the project not penciling out. Well, it's a great question. I wish there were a simpler answer, but I, maybe I can simplify it by saying that even if all of those conclusions and assumptions played out at the time we looked at it, let's say this week, we still don't know the final conditions of the equity contributions and the partners, which could shuffle those numbers around again. That's why I say to you, sure, I mean, as of the time of the last iteration, before the last two, all things being equal, those pro forma look like they could work. Since then, we've had hotel uh, prognostications that are significantly higher, which may perhaps justifiable. I think Mr. Zisslis did a good job in making a case that the current set of comparison that's typically used doesn't really quite fit the boutique hotel that he is conceiving. So there are real sort of disconnects, right, that would have to be vetted out. And part of that disconnect, by the way, is we're absent the conditions of the actual equity contributions because we don't, final, we don't have final commitment letters. So they go hand in hand. It's the returns are okay. The hotel data is yet to be looked at, could be okay. The developer funding commitments 
seem to be there on a preliminary basis, but the actual co conditions of those commitments not played out yet. So it's an incomplete picture in essence for all three, but when it comes to the finite understanding of the internal numbers that we were provided in the pro forma, knowing that we have some things outstanding, those looked defensible to us. Okay. Hopefully that, that works. And that's why I think this additional time makes some sense if you're inclined to do it. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, any, any further? All right, we'll bring it back to the, to, to the council for comments. Eric McConnell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I did want to give some thoughts on this project um, and really do two things. I wanted to uh, first thank everybody involved who has contributed to this project. I think it really is an in, a really a dynamic and interesting project, one of the most interesting I've seen. And the second, I want to explain um, how I intend to vote tonight and what led me to this decision. Uh, the last thing I want to say is I greatly respect all of my colleagues on city council. Regardless of how they vote tonight, I do want to emphasize that I believe that they will vote their conscience. And whatever they may arrive at, I will accept and know that they did the best they could with the information that they had. So given that, I want to, do, to first say that um, I intend to vote yes on this project tonight. The first reason is residents. Residents have long talked about wanting a better downtown. They've showed up consistently. They spoke up in favor of this project again and again. They've talked about wanting a vibrant place with things to do day and night, a place where they can work, live, and play. They talked about a gathering place that will integrate with Pioneer Park and existing businesses support the small businesses already in downtown while bringing in new ones. This project does that. The second is revenue the financials of this project. This project would bring in $700,000 a year in tax revenue. It would generate more sales tax. It would bring more businesses in. It would support existing businesses. And I believe the project fundamentals are strong. The third are risks. While the, all projects entail risks, this developer has gone above and beyond to address the city's risks or the, the city's concerns. Uh, they've given us the opportunity to take the property back in nine months if certain conditions are not met. Um, the, the city will continue to get revenue even if the hotel is not built. Uh, tax revenue is guaranteed for 20 years. And while nothing is ever free, uh, no, nothing is ever risk-free, I do believe the developer has gone to great lengths to address our concerns and will continue as the project moves forward. The fourth is the developer's reputation and whether or not that they can deliver. And when I look at the partners in this room and I look at the people who've proposed this idea, I do believe that they have a track record of delivering and a track record of meeting residents' needs. There are buildings that are standing today because of the work that they did, and I do believe that they will do the same for the city. And the final, uh, the final reason why I'm voting for this is the journey that I've been on. I started out as a skeptic of this project. In fact, the way that I met Isabella Ebner was uh, chatting with her on next door and actually saying, I don't know why we would turn down a, a big hotel. It seemed like a reasonable proposal to me. Uh, and as I got to know the project more and more, I became a believer in it. Um, and I do believe that the project and the way it was conceived is one that is worth breathing life into. This project is a result of the vision of council member uh, Vienna and Isabella Ebner. It really shows what we're capable of when we, when we work together and we unite. And because of the beauty of this project and how we've gone about modifying it and bringing it into a place that will work for the city, uh, I can think of no pr project or vote that I will probably cast during my time in city council that I could be more proud of. Uh, and so, um, as I think about this project tonight, I can't give it a higher endorsement and a higher level of support, uh, given what I believe it would do for this city, that it'll keep tax dollars here, that it shows what's possible uh, for future generations moving to the city, and for all the things, the legacy it would build, buildings that will stand, that will stand the test of time. And so I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight to vote on this. And I wish my council members, my colleagues, good luck. And as you come to your own decisions, and what will be one of the most consequential, consequential votes of your tenure in this city? 
and I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Eric Weber. Um, <clears throat> I'll just say, I'll keep it short. Um, I'm supportive of moving forward with the DDA, although cautiously. Um, I think that's healthy in this kind of situation. There's still a lot of, as we've found out, a lot of stuff that's still up in the air that's uh, pretty significant as far as the project goes. Um, but uh, I, I think some of the controls that city staff has worked directly with PSQ to put into place um, are, are reasonable and uh, it will enable us to continue working together to make sure that it's a, it's a successful project. So that's it. Thank you. Ryan? This is, uh, I appreciate staff's work on this. I appreciate Michael, your team, Mr. Tessier, and the Zisless group, all the work that's gone into this. Uh, I think that, I think a lot of things about this project, and this project's been an interesting journey. Uh, and thank you, uh, Councilmember Nakano, uh, for your words, and I appreciate your position. Uh, I think that reflecting on this project, uh, there's a lot of moving parts to it from battling uh, from from getting elected in 2017 and learning about an RFP that uh, Cosmont had done with the previous or a couple city managers ago I guess one would say uh, to the materialization of a big hotel proposal that uh, I did not believe at that time that that project that the the city engaged in ENA with reflected what the community needed and I thought that that project was off balance. It didn't balance the needs of the community and the wants of the community. It really prioritized what was uh, frankly a, a money machine for the city and I thought that was wrong. I thought that there were people here in the community that and as we've heard tonight from so many they wanted more. They wanted a place to dine. They wanted to stop going to Claremont or Laverne uh, or Glendora. And they wanted more things that would improve their quality of life. And so uh, I found uh, an ally in that eventually, which was uh, Isabel Ebner, who uh, ultimately strummed up a rather robust campaign and got a lot of people involved um, and really educated people on what was happening and eventually uh, with the help of uh, the mayor uh, well council member Badar at the time now the mayor um, we were able to go down a different path <clears throat> and that different path started down a, a, a way that allowed us to examine different proposals talk about different ideas and it really caused a lot of thought a lot of uh, provocative thought, a lot of what can it be, what could it be, what should it be, and hearing from a lot of different people about those ideas and those concepts. Um, somewhere in that, we decided to engage with what has become the PSQ project. And, and I think that was for a lot of reasons. Uh, speaking for myself, I think that uh, the work that's been done by this team uh, is good, and my wife and I, I'm a regular at Gus's. It's ridiculous. Their, their mojitos are fantastic. Um, and I probably need to stop going there. Um, but the bottom line is it is a good establishment and the Whisper House and all the other things that are there, uh, as well as the hotel uh, that's there. I think that looking at those type of things are things that are very provocative to residents here. Um, they like that. We like that. I like that. Um, but this project has morphed and it continued to morph and you know someone recently uh had sent a comment to me about this saying you know what started out as a no big hotel campaign um to a degree in the community has turned into like well it's okay if we get a big hotel as long as we have some shops some restaurants and so forth and i don't know that I entirely agree with that, but I agree with certain contexts of it that this, this project has caused me such great consternation to really reflect on what is our community. And 
And when you talk about that, and, and as we heard some people say tonight, when I was younger, growing up here in town, I would frequently, we would walk to the San Dimas Equestrian Center, the Nature Center, downtown. We'd see what was going on with uh, Western Days and farmers markets and all of that stuff, which was awesome. Those things, and I still agree that those things should be in downtown, uh, and I hope we can get there. But on the flip side, I also think that there's an acknowledgement when you look at the demographics in the community that people come here for certain things. They come here because they want safe streets. They want that quaint bedroom community. And in wanting the quaint bedroom community and in wanting all of those things, there's a certain sacrifice that's made. What's interesting, and my wife who is here uh, and moved here with me, she grew up elsewhere uh, and in the South Bay and, and a, a different place. She lived in Pasadena. And she pointed out to me that, you know, people move here knowing what this community is and they move here knowing what some of those things are that they accept about our town. And those things are some of those things that after five o'clock, things are dead downtown. And people understand that, you know, this is a predominantly bedroom community for the most part. I say all this to say that I think the project went too far past the mark as it relates to housing because this was supposed to be a project that balanced all of the interests for the community. That being said, the hotel, the commercial aspect of it with the restaurants and what have you, and the housing, which we understood. The parking is a piece of it, and I think it needs to happen. They say in politics, Often you don't appeal to intellect, you appeal to interests. And that's where we're at right now because based off of the facts of what's before the city right now, this vote tonight is simply a leap of faith. Yeah, there's assurances and insurance and, and all the jazz that goes with that. But at the end of the day, uh, and as was said, this vote also has to deal with uh, will there be somewhere for someone to take their, their grandkids or, or their children to um, that is other than uh, Baskin Robbins perhaps uh, in a shopping center that maybe we can see some redevelopment one day. Um, so I'm going to go with the leap of faith despite a number of reservations that I have regarding this particular project and I hope that my concerns are well heard by the developer. I've not, uh, I'm not comfortable with vague and am ambiguous uh, conclusions. I don't, I don't gamble when I go to Vegas, and I, I really, this is against a lot of things that I feel in my conscience, uh, Eric, but I also know that if that hotel doesn't materialize, $500,000 out of this $700,000 number is gone, and I don't care about the, the payments and all that stuff because I'm confident there will be other projects and things like that and I know your life finds a way as, as it said in Jurassic Park so um, you know the bottom line is I hope I pray to God that this all pencils out and that it becomes the robust project that you guys have promised the community uh, and the constituents here I hope that your number in when the dust settles is closer to 60 and not 90 um, and I'm just going to hope, but I can, you know, I can say, you know, well, I'm not even going to say that. Okay. So bottom line is, please uh, do what you can to do, make good on the things that you've said. And um, I want to thank my wife uh, for some of her counsel and insight and um, generally being a, a good rock. I want to thank Isabel Ebner uh, and a number of the people that have been patient with this. I also think that, uh, and Cosmont as well. Um, I do think that, that we're not even close to being done with this. That's the truth of the matter. And, um, and I'm sure there's gonna be many more fun meetings ahead. But uh, nevertheless, I do think that uh, this is hopefully gonna be a good nine months with good news and uh, we'll move forward, so. Thank you, Ryan. I don't even know if I need to say anything. The, the reality is there has been uh, a lot of conversations, there's been a lot of work. I've talked with Mr. Deaton several times, um, met with as much as even two hours ago 
trying to figure out the right thing to do, the right thing to say. Uh, everyone who counseled me in any way, shape, or form said, follow your heart. Um, what you think is best for the city of San Dimas. And uh, I am concerned about 97 condos, as we've talked. Uh, I was more comfortable with the 60. Uh, it's become a housing development. But I, am, I have, like Ryan, I have a, a leap of faith, for whatever that word is, is that Mr. Deaton knows, Mr. Tessier knows, that we're actually, our game is in, in their ballpark. And that we, although we've gotten a lot of things tightened up with, in the, over the last two weeks, and uh, I've, re I've received insurances by both our councils and uh, our city staff and by uh, Pioneer Square folks, um, I'm glad to see that I believe that we can get to a 4-0 vote and I'll think that we'll move forward instead of any more conversation. One more thing is I do want to thank uh, Isabel and the people around her, the people who believed in this project. I did receive several phone calls today questioning certain things about the parking, uh, but after talking with the staff, I think we're gonna get through there. And so at this point, I'll call for a vote. I'll, uh make a motion that we approve resolution 2022-53 approving the DDA and covenant agreement and CEQA sustainable communities project exemption including the amendments made by Mr. Galante. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Build. Michael. 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 Build us a good project. Thank you, uh, council members. Thank you, uh, council member Vienna for, for your, uh, I know this was a, a, a tough consideration and uh, I, I think we're gonna owe your wife probably a, 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 a free event there when, when we open up that rooftop. No, 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 for the record, no, we, no, no. We didn't hear that. <laughs> no, that, that, that was a sense of humor. But thank you. Thank you for your consideration and uh, and thank you, staff. Thank you, Cosmont. Uh, and uh, we look forward to taking this to the next level with all of you. Thank you. All right. Okay, we're going to move on to other business. Yeah. We're going to take a 10 minute break. Thank you, guys.
Okay, we're, we're going to move as quickly as we can, but make sure we do the right to make the right decision. Understand? Okay, I said it. <laughs> okay. We're going to reconvene the council meeting and then move on to other business. Discussion and consideration of installation of two prefabricated metal bus shelters on Bonita Avenue, east of San Dimas Avenue. Okay, staff. Oh, Sherry. Sherry Garway. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. The item before you tonight is a request for your approval to install two prefabricated metal bus shelters at a, on Benita Avenue, just east of San Dimas Avenue. You have a slide. Um, oh, waiting for the slides. Oh, the slides. Um, I also supplied a, a sample board for council to uh, to look at some of the material of of the pre, uh, polycarbonate roof in the metal shelter. So this is an aerial of the location where the two bus shelters. Um, this is Benita, and this is San Dimas Avenue. Um, th these sites were selected because it, there's existing bus shelters there, and their proximity close to uh, amenities in the downtown. So just to give a quick slide of some of the, the amenities adjacent to the bus shelters. This is an example of an existing wooden bus shelter that's at those locations right now. Um, for, for members of the audience that aren't, uh, weren't, weren't here for the last uh, bus shelter um, meeting, we're looking at replacing these wooden bus shelters for several reasons. Um, basically, they're, they're aging out. They're, um, they're individually fabricated for each site, so um, it requires fabrication for whenever you go to replace an element. Um, they're very difficult to sanitize, as we found out with the, the pandemic. That, be, that becomes more important. Um, and also, they're, um, it takes a lot of work to remove graffiti and also to keep splinter, them splinter free. Also, one of the main drawbacks of these is they're difficult to relocate. And um, the bus stops do relocate and are relocated by uh, Foothill Transit um, um, in, due to changes in ridership. So that's a, a consideration for all bus shelters. Additionally, another component of this is with the bus is uh, the bus bench here is a five foot bus bench. However, typically you only get one person that sits on the bench. The other, the others will stand because they don't want to sit that close to each other. With these considerations, staff is recommending moving to a metal prefabricated bus shelter that would address those concerns. Um, and the, the prefabricated bus shelter is very easy to relocate. At a previous meeting, City Council directed the staff to research the Brasco Axle Retreat Shelter, shown here, with a prefabricated polycarbonate roof. Staff reviewed the design with LA Host, who indicated there are several positive elements with this particular design. We also worked with the Foothill Transit. Um, while they didn't have much detrimental to say of the bus shelter, they would like to see a, a much larger, much more expensive bus shelter at the locations that we're designating. Sh Sherry, could you explain what you just said? Okay, um, Foothill Transit, um, when, I, when I spoke with uh, the, the CEO of Foothill Transit, they have a, um, the, the bus stations or the bus shelters at those locations are very close to the Gold Line station that's coming in. So they, they requested a, a much larger bus shelter um, that it was much more permanent. Um, for instance, it had concrete blocks as opposed to a bench. But um, our thought with these is um, to install them. Um, the, um, the Foothill Transit shelters have some drawbacks that, that this bus shelter eliminates. 
So that's why we're recommending going with this bus shelter. Okay, with this bus shelter though, it, the way it's fastened to the, to the ground, if we decide this is not the right, if the Public Works comes back and says this is not the right mix, how difficult is it to remove? It's actually one of the, the, key, the key advantages. I don't know what I just did. But that's one of the key advantages of this bus shelter is it's very easy to relocate. If uh, the shelter's mounted on a six foot by six foot slab uh, that has uh, rebar reinforcement, if, if uh, we wanted to relocate this bus shelter and remove it, um, there's four anchor bolts. Remove the anchor bolts, cut them off, epoxy it, and it's a sidewalk now once we remove the bus shelter. So there's, okay. no, there's no posts that we have to remove. Um, in fact, this is the next slide. Um, this is, these are the, the four anchor bolts that would have to be removed and epoxy over it, and you have a smooth sidewalk again. Thank you. Sherry, in terms of the Foothill Transit recommendation, uh, their recommendation is based on what? The proximity to the gold line? Yes, so they're looking at a much larger bus shelter in this location. The shelter that we're proposing, um, actually you can, you can install another one side by side to expand it, you, or more, multiple ones to expand it, but it's much easier to keep clean and it's much more cost effective if we... These are? These are, yes. These are. The, the Foothill Transit one is... They didn't come up with a particular design, so they had... Um, they had multiple concepts, um, uh -huh. but they were all ex pretty, very expensive. So if their, concern, their concerns, I'm assuming their concerns capacity. Yes. But we can offset that by simply putting up another one or two. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. And the, these are easier to keep clean. There's had um, a backing and, and some other stuff that we would like to, to not install. Right. Just and because of e maintenance. And LA Host, you mean, is that the Homeless Outreach Services team, the Sheriff's Department, yes. reviewed it? Okay. Yes, right, and they you. had several positive things to say about this particular design. Okay. Okay. Um, some of the concerns that Council expressed last time was uh, um, the shade area, to increase the shade area. We just talked about that. that we can also mount a, uh, a shroud on the back to increase the, the shade um, somewhat. Um, Another um, area of concern actually was the bench uh, getting hot, the thermal temperature on the bench. Um, this structure does not come with an alternative material for the bench. Um, it, it, it's a metal bench. It's painted, it comes painted the, the color of the shelter. Um, if, the, if the temperature is a problem, we can look at do, doing different things, um, you know, uh, look at um, maybe adding a different material on top of the existing. So there's some, there's some things that we can do, or we can paint it a different color. So a lighter colored paint would, be di would, would not heat up as much. So m our thought was to try this as, as, a stand, as it comes shipped, and then we'll see if we need to make some adjustments. Okay. Also, council had asked about uh, solar panels. This does come, the, the, the quote we received what included so solar panels. Um, uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is... Um, what are the solar panels going to actually do? Yeah. <laughs> Other so, than be a solar panel. <laughs> so what they do is they provide lighting. Okay. Oh, solar lighting right. for that. So um, is one of the items that, that can be done. So uh, that was what was requested was to have lighting at the... Um, it, and the that shelter. would be instead of electrical lights or a supplemental to... In, in lieu of. In lieu of, so. okay. Right. There's no uh, power outlets on there, correct? No. Okay. Uh, you talked about maintenance. What does maintenance look like for one of these things? Is it something that somebody goes and hoses down like once a week or is it... Probably less frequently, but okay. yes. So it, when needed, we'd come through and, and, and hose it down. Also check the bolts to make sure they're tight. This is, that's one of the key advantages of this. This comes shipped in a uh, four components and you come through and you bolt them together and, it, and you have your bus shelter. So when we talk about maintenance and, and coming along and wash, washing it down, would it, could it be typically like when our staff uh, hoses down and sprays down the downtown? Yes. 
uh, area there? Yes. And it's one of those things they could just reach around and Okay. And, and typically we, we maintain the bus shelters once a month. So we go through and the wooden bus shelters and, and look at them and maintain those once a month. So that's what I would anticipate this would be, unless, unless we needed it more. And, so. and then just one additional question. When we're looking at the seats, what, what, is, the, what is the size of the seats? Um, they're 18 inches tall and they're 20 inches wide. So they're, they're a little narrow. Nobody's going to get real comfortable on them, but they will give you some respite. Each one would sit two people. Yes. Each, each shelter. Each shelter. Each shelter would sit two Yes. People. Okay. The, the prefabrication of them, I guess, or I mean the easy fabrication, it sounds like. I know just, I know there's been, a, I can think of one specifically where there's been an accident that's hit or uh, damaged one of the bus shelters. Um, in, in time here, this in the event that there was an unfortunate accident or something like that that took one of these out, um, it would not be very complicated to put a bus stop or a, one of these shelters back up then, right? I mean, presumably, it sounds like this is really not gonna be like fabricating one like right. in the past. This would be just pull it out of the box, assemble it and put it back up? As long as the foundation's not damaged, but yes. Yes, okay. typically it would, it's shear at the anchor bolts. Or and, and the solar makes this, ra I mean, rather portable, I guess then, right? So, yes. I mean, we're really not dealing with electrical or anything like that? No, no. Well, wow. okay. So the, the, one, the one item that we uh, was discussed at the last meeting was the polycarbonate roof and what I wanted to pass the board the sample board around was for you to see the polycarbonate roof it's um, it's I wouldn't say flimsy but it's not what we would it's plastic so the problem with plastic in, in the Southern California Sun is it tends to yellow so this would um, not survive be a survivable and it probably wouldn't look as as good um, in Southern California for, for very long. So our recommendation is to go with a metal roof um, and the quiet prices that we've been quoted include the metal roof. So with, with that, um, that concludes my presentation unless you have other questions. The recommendation from staff is to um, uh, approve moving forward with the Brasco axle retreat design with the, the metal roofing for the two locations on uh, Bonita Avenue, just east of San Dimas Avenue. What, what were the, just for, out of curiosity, the Sheriff's Department host team uh, feedback, what were, what were their comments as it relates to design? Um, some of the comments were that it was, uh, I mean, it looked easier to maintain, difficult for um, making attachments to it um, or storing things um, it's uh, not comfortable for somebody to sleep there f for long periods of time. Um, I'm trying to think, is uh, did Kayla make it in? No, but th those were typically the the comments that they had. So it's used as a temporary transit waiting location, basically. Yeah, just a yes, yes. Okay. Sherry, I just had one question, and um, some uh, transit systems use some uh, d digital display displays which um, give the potential bus riders some information on arrival time schedules, other routes. Sometimes you could even say, I want to get here from here, and it'll give you the, the routes that you might have to, and this is obviously for people who are uh, bus dependent mm -hmm. or public transit dependent. Um, is there a way of modifying these shelters if we had wanted to in the future or if Foothill Transit wanted to, to attach or somehow have a display like that? Wait, so there is, there, there is a possibility of putting a, a, a um, fixed display schedule for like a, a schedule on, on the post itself. Um, we are looking at if the, of fixing some sort of a digital display, the problem becomes power. So the power would have to, source would have to be separate. So we couldn't mount an, an additional solar array on top of this, um, on top of the canopy. Um, but the other, the other concern with having um, affixing something to the structure, to the structure that belongs to Foothill Transit 
is a concern is we have to make sure that the information is accurate. If they change something, we don't we don't know that it's accurate. So that's for the fixed display. And then it um, typically what would happen is you would have a separate post mounted with a with a solar array on top that would power or feed your um, digital display. Um, that so way, if if we need to take the the shelter down for some reason, say it's dirty or it's rusted through, then we would um, we can take the shelter down without um, affecting any of the route information that's at that stop. So if Foothill Transit wanted to start doing that in some we, future, we would they, definitely they, you would them. want them to have like a separate Foothill Transit maintained post I, with the uh, you know. We would work with them, but we would. We would request that it be separate. Yes, their their, their display and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, that makes sense. All right, thanks. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, how many bus stops do we have actually in the city of San Dimas? So, uh, I believe it's thirty four um, bus stops, um, thirty four active citywide, and eighteen of those have shelters at them right now. We have had some requests for additional shelters where we've put a, a bench. Um, potentially this could, if this works out, this could be a, a consideration for some of those. Is, is there any, any possibility that we could uh, get some type of grant from, from Foothill, Shel uh, Foothill Shelter, Foot <laughs> <laughs> Foothill Transportation to assist us in, in putting some of these, more of them up over a period of time? Absolutely. In fact, the, these shelters at this location, um, the city did receive a grant from Foothill Transit for $40,000 to put these two, sh two uh, shelters up. So that's why we're actually trying it. So we're basically looking at $20,000 a shelter? Approximately, yes. Okay. And, it, and we will be having some crew time to offset some of the costs because they've been increasing over time. But we'll, our, our maintenance crew will assemble it, for instance. So, Are we looking at a... Or have you set up some type of uh, listing on where you plan on putting the next ones up at? And uh, if, if, if these are work, if they work out. Yes. And, and tomorrow we mysteriously come up with a ton of extra money. We have some type of an idea where we would. Yes. You know, we'd work in, cons, you know, along with concert with uh, Foothill Trans. Yes, we would we would coordinate the locations with Foothill Transit, and then and w but we do have the 18, and we would prioritize those based on ridership information given provided by Foothill Transit. Super. I, I recently met with the um, pastor at uh, Holy Name, who had some concerns about the uh, northwest corner of uh, mm -hmm. San Dimas Canyon and uh, Bonita. Uh, about some seniors having to stand out in the sun and all this other stuff. He he was very concerned about it, and I, I told him that we would, you know, discuss it with you. Okay. Uh, when he first told me about it, it I, I tried to pass it on to uh, Laverne, but uh, it got passed back pretty quickly, <laughs> like within a minute. <laughs> I happened to be sitting with the mayor of Laverne at the time, but, you know, we, priest, we, priest was actually telling me about the uh, north east corner when in reality he says hey we don't have a bus stop there <laughs> so <laughs> well, because that but i mean there there is a concern that we do have seniors that you know wait for the bus and uh, i'm glad that we have at least a couple of of seats so Does, all right any, any other questions of staff in terms of installation I know there's a couple bus stops, um, like for example, along Foothill, and I think there's others on Via Verde that are off uh, the beaten path, if you will. They're not on sidewalks, they're in equestrian or multi-use trails or whatever. Um, so if you were gonna install this, like in some of them, like off of Foothill uh, near where I'm at, there's a bench, so and there's no lighting. Mm -hmm. So something like this would actually be an improvement um, is it as simple as just digging a hole, pouring uh, concrete, and then putting, I mean, just basically putting a foundation in to stand one of these up? Yes. So uh, we would want to make sure we had all the amenities for uh, accessibility. So to make sure we had four foot clear in front of it and, and to the side so the bus, the full width of the bus so that we, or concrete slab, the full width of the bus so that it, when it stops, people can get off on onto a concrete pad is typically what we try. 
So, um, so would a concrete pad be necessary? I, I was kind of listening to Ryan. I was kind of wondering if, if, if you were talking about putting it on dirt and, and just, a pad, just a pillar. Right, like one, the one on Foothill. Uh, in the horse up there, yeah. There's the equestrian trail, yeah. and then there's just an opening, and the, and it used to be that it, that stop actually was near the Sandy Miss Equestrian Center, but it's since moved now, west. Right. And I think there's, I think there is a bench there, uh, but it's recessed. Mm -hmm. It's not actually at the stop, I don't think. The um, the consideration for lighting would be that it, the, it's not under a tree or, or something. So we, there has to be some some uh, siding considerations. But but yes, it could be. I mean, it's these are very cheap to install comparatively to other structures. So cool. Thank you. I had two questions. Uh, the first is what determines? So you said I think there were thirty four stops. Eighteen of them have. Uh, shelters. Which determine what determines which ones get shelters and not? Is it just based on traffic? Is it is there a formula? Um, how is that decision made? So when we make the decision to put in a, a shelter, we contact tra Foothill Transit to make sure that the um, uh, what what bus stops mm -hmm. have the most ridership is what we try to um, uh, and make sure that that's going to continue to be a stop because that um, the stops do change over time and we have a, a few shelters that are no longer at bus stops, but the, re the residents have requested that they remain because the, the, it, apparently some people sit on the shelter or, or sit at the bus shelter and, and, and watch traffic or something. So we, we did allow some to remain, um, but we also take um, uh, calls from our, from our constituents, from our residents to say uh, which ones, um, you know, if it, it, uh, we have some seniors that uh, that frequent a bus stop uh, more, one bus stop more, and then that would be um, a higher priority probably than a bus stop that we haven't received requests for a shelter. So it seems to me that if there are um, <coughs> bus stops or, or shelters where there are not stations, and we do have seniors who need it, and there's a number of stops that don't have it. I understand residents may want a bus shelter in a place where there's no bus stop, but that may be something we may want to look at if it's depriving people who are going to be waiting for a bus not to have a place to sit. Um, and I wondered how many of them are out there that are not attached to a bus stop. So uh, there's only there's only a few, and the reason why they were remaining is it, it's very difficult to remove the, the existing bus shelters, uh, the wooden bus shelters. Yeah. So when you remove them, they don't really go back together. So so, so it wasn't it wasn't just move it. Okay. Yeah, it's not like it, it's here and not there. It's it's okay. it probably would have been scrapped. So compared to the options that you looked at, which what are the life what are the average lifetime. Um, lifetimes of each of the different shelters. I know I don't. I think you may have mentioned th this one, but it, what, what, what was the comparison in terms of lifetime? Um, Prefabricated shelters are, are generally have a much longer lifetime than, say, the wooden. Sure. Um, so you're looking. At, I mean, we've had those wooden shelters 20, 25 years. This would I would say 30 to 40 years. Oh on wow. A, okay. On a it's much longer than I thought. Okay. Thank you. Depending on traffic, too. Yeah. <laughs> so. The remediation of these bus stops in the event of vandalism, uh, as compared to our current shelters, is it seems would be easier. I mean, is it either painting or graffiti removal? It's significantly easier. Uh, in the wooden existing wooden bus shelters, um, when people spray paint it, the paint seeps into the wood. So not only do we have the surface to treat, we have to, we have to sand the shelter down to remove all hints of the stain. And then... Other people carve stuff into the graffiti into the, the wooden shelters, so then we have to sand it down to remove the, the, the carved. This is, has a graffiti coating on it, and it's, it's, a paint, it's painted equivalent of San Dimas Brown, so we have plenty of that paint around. <laughs> I, I like uh, Councilmember Nakano's comment that if there are, given the, the I, I, wanna, I was going to say cost savings, but I mean, given the cost effectiveness of this as compared to other options or alternatives, if the city realizes, and, and this ends up being functional uh, and um, you know achieves the goals uh, for the city while mitigating other concerns, 
that uh, I would be interested in, in evaluating what those sites are if we did remove them to be able to place shelters there um, for people who, who need them. And, and whether seniors or not, I think that there's areas where there are stops that, uh, you know, every, I guess it's how do you prioritize who needs a shelter or not, but at the same time, I'm empathetic uh, to the seniors as a priority. But I also think that there are still areas, I mean, personally, I'd love to see shelters at every single bus stop in the city uh, like this because I just think it's important and I like the portability of it as it relates to this that doesn't lend itself to establishing mini dwellings or mm -hmm. housing that otherwise would be commandeered, exacerbating another issue. So well, that's where I'm at. You bring up an interesting point in, uh, in putting shelters, that, you know, the, the thought of leaving a shelter somewhere where there's no bus stop at first that kind of dumbfounded me why somebody would want that. But, you know, uh, nowadays with different modalities of transportation, not just limiting somebody to, uh, you know, buses, um, you have, you know, senior uh, van services that will come pick you up from your, uh, from your home. You have, um, you know, Uber and, and Lyft and, and things that, uh, seniors do rely on in addition to uh, public transportation. So it might be something uh, interesting to look at down the road to uh, to install outside of uh, install one of these shelters outside of a uh, senior living complex or a mobile home park that's uh, mainly for seniors just so that they can wait for other forms of transportation and a little more comfort. We're off to Arrow west of the 57. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, I will uh, move approval of staff's recommendation as proposed. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a couple comments, and uh, I'm going to support uh, the motion. We already went over different types of bus shelters and had a big discussion about that, I think, in a couple different meetings um, during, over the past year. But I will support this, uh, this shelter under the premise that any shelter is better than no shelter. Um, the drawbacks, I feel, and I just wanted to express them simply because I think they are, are not addressed by this particular uh, design. Uh, but again, I do support it, and um, I like some of my colleagues that would like these shelters in various places, and if we need more seats, they should be expanded. But um, some of the, sh this sh shelter anyway, does not have a covered place where a person in a wheelchair could sit, where some other designs did. And so I, I think that's a, a drawback to this particular mm. type of shelter. Um, person in a wheelchair has to be outside of the roof area. Uh, there are only two seats, which is a small number of seats. And um, people uh, do, I think, I think we're right in saying that strangers may not be sitting next to one another at a bus stop. However, if the bus bench is a little bit bigger, um, like, Th for three people or even four, then it is possible, and you see this in places where buses, where there's a, a node or some place, a corner where there's more people riding the bus, there will be people occupying, you know, multiple people occupying one bench. Um, but beyond that, um, there are many cases where more than one person are going to want to sit next to each other. And two cases that come to mind immediately are a parent, mom or dad, or, and a child or two. And so in this case, you're separated by that pole, not that it's insurmountable or anything like that, but, but it is nicer, especially if the kids are in the younger age range, to be able to sit right next to, to your, or for, well, actually nicer for the child to sit next to their parent, uh, or, or an older brother or, or whatever. The other, and I mentioned this before, was that, um, and I've experienced because I have a developed my only disabled sister, but a, a lot of times um, to give um, folks uh, something to do, um, there will be, out, I don't want to call, call them outing, outings or part of a program where um, a caregiver will take another person, um, and it doesn't have to be developmentally disabled, it could be somebody who's elderly, but you have a caregiver taking that other person to the library, to the park, to the store, doctor's appointment, whatever it might be, and they are using the bus. And so to have them separated by that pole, there's, a, there's just a comfort 
when the two people can sit next to each other and you know, actually be physically touching probably, or maybe one with an arm around the other. So these are drawbacks to these kinds of shelters. So I'm supportive of these shelters. I would like on our next go round to maybe, if anybody wants to reconsider the style of something where we could have a, a longer bench, at least for that one reason of having people who would like to sit together be able to, to, to do so. You know, if you're a couple out on a date, another example, um, you know, hugging that pole <laughs> while your sweetheart's on the other side isn't quite as nice as having the person right next to you. So those are the drawbacks that I, I see, um, but I will support the motion. I, uh, I will just mention, uh, actually, when you mentioned the, uh, the handicap spot, it got me thinking. Um, and while our, our current bus stops don't accommodate any covered spot for handicap uh, riders either, uh, I would absolutely be in favor because of the, the the modular nature of these bus stops. It looks like we could just not attach one of the benches. So if if there's any bus stops in which we have more than one of these shelters at, uh, I would absolutely be in favor of not attaching one of the benches and leaving it. You know, putting a sign up there for for um, a handicap seating. I'm not. I, I agree with what he's saying, but before I would totally stipulate to removing the bench, I would be curious what the measurements are on the overhang, because looking at that, if in a, if a person in a wheelchair can simply just back up to the pole, mm -hmm. then you don't need to remove the bench. It still can accommodate the person in the wheelchair. And, you know, but the overall thing it says 72 inches, mm -hmm. six feet. Yeah. So the, the other thing potentially, uh, you know, if you sp instead of squeezing them right up against each other, if you left a little bit of a gap between the two and then just connected the roofs, potentially you have four benches and a yeah. spot for handicap. Yeah. When, and the other, th the other part of this thing is I realize that we have 30 plus, but only 18 um, covered, covered spaces. But, you know, we, we get this program going. We have an opportunity to evaluate uh you know their usability and then maybe we decide that downtown you know in the that we want two on either side and and then so your boyfriend girlfriend husband wife maybe have six <laughs> inches in between them or something but you know most of us sleep in a bed that's for bigger than that so the reality is that there's a way to do it if we did put two of them up and uh, i think that uh this this is a good start. I mean, how many years has it been since we did anything with bus stops? And quite honestly, we don't really know what we're going to accomplish uh, as far as bus stops are concerned or what's going to be the need for them after the goal line gets here. You know, there's conversation that there may not, you know, certain uh, bus routes may not be active. We don't know that, but so that's... This is a good start, and, and I appreciate uh, the, uh, the work that you guys have done. I appreciate the fact that you reached out and talked with uh, uh, Foothill Transportation, and I think we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 5-0. Thank you. By the way, how long before we're going to see the first one up? Tomorrow, uh, it, it'll it'll be a while. We because of the grant process, we have to go through um, through Foothill Transit, get their approval, and then then once we get that, we can start moving forward. Super, thank you. All right, seeing no other business, we'll move on to oral communications. Members of the audience, speakers are limited to three minutes, or as may be determined by the chair. Ma'am. Good evening. I wish I had talked earlier, but I wasn't used to the agenda because I'm coming from Rancho, but I'm Diana Voss. I am with the Rising Stars Equestrian Therapy Program. As you guys know, we, we just moved from Rancho Cucamonga to uh, San Dimas Equestrian Center. 
Um, coming December 4th, we have our horse show. Um, we do have Santa come along and pass out candy canes to the disabled kids. We also do Christmas carols with some of the kids. And when we were um, operating out of Heritage Park in Rancho Cucamonga, we would also extend an invitation to mayor and council to um, attend part of the day. Um, sometimes we have them go out into the arena and pass out ribbons um, for, for a few of the classes. I understand there might be another city event that day, but I wanted to, you know, come tonight and offer that opportunity to you guys. We're, we're um, excited to be in San Dimas. We're kind of sad we had to leave Ranch Cucamonga under the circumstances that we did. Um, but I, you know, wanted to, to attend tonight to, to say we're here. We, we hope you can attend if you're available. Um, and we, you know, we look forward to, um, you know, future, uh, meet and greets with you guys. Um, I also would, would have liked to said something sooner with all the other individuals here because, um, there were some individuals who, you know, might've wanted to bring their kids. We do open house lessons on Saturday mornings from 9.30 to about 10.30, actually, sorry, 9 to about 10.30 where anybody can come ride any ability, disability, you know, whatever the case may be. So, um, I just wanted to, to invite you guys. We will start the show December 4th at about 9 a.m. and we'll probably go to about 2. So. Super. Uh, could I ask you to uh, see Scott? Uh, he's our uh, recreation oh, there you go. <laughs> rec. Yes. And, uh, make sure that he has that information. Yes, uh, yes. I'm looking at the calendar and I'm, I'm not seeing much on December 4th. Okay. Uh, we, but, but the night before is our annual tree lining okay maybe that's what the, the gal at the front desk was talking about yeah. but so yeah we, we'd absolutely love some of you to come um we'd you know we, we'd be excited to have you guys he's the guy that will let us know all right <laughs> thank welcome you welcome to San Dimas oh thank you <laughs> Hi. okay seeing anybody else wishing to speak to the council Seeing none, we'll move on. City manager's report. Uh, very quickly, uh, we're one of the few cities that had the housing element certified by ACD prior to the October 15 deadline. Uh, our two sister cities neighboring us have not yet. So I think that we should uh, thank the council for approving it, uh, thank staff and the consultant who worked hard to get it down to the wire was approved the day before the deadline, which is fantastic. Um, there are two events that are upcoming. There's the Walker House of Horrors, which is Thursday, October 27th through the 30th. The event spans from 6 to 8 o'clock, and for Friday and Saturday, it goes until 9 o'clock. Uh, on Saturday, October 29th, the San Dimas Merchants and the Chamber of Commerce were having the Trick or Treat Shop Walk from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Participating downtown merchants will offer free candy and treats for costume kids age 12 and under. Sorry, none of us qualify. Uh, residents should look for a purple flyer with a ghost on it in the window of participating businesses. The businesses are all along Bonita in the downtown with one edition of Railside Cafe on San Dimas Avenue. With that, Mr. Mayor, I'll give it back to you. Thank you. City Attorney? No reports, Mayor. Thank you. Members of the City Council, uh, uh, Council members reports on meetings attended at the expense of the local agency. Seeing none, we'll move on to City Council requests for future items, comments, and updates. Councilman Vienna. Uh, I'll just say thank you to staff and the volunteers and everyone for the holiday extravaganza. Wait a minute, wrong holiday. Halloween Spooktacular? There we are, yeah, sorry. Um, that was wild, uh, you guys did an uh, incredible job and the turnout was just out of this world. I think uh, Historical Society, the Chamber, everybody's trunk or treat uh, <laughs> thing was rad. Margie, your guys, this was cracking me up. I love the banjos and what was going on there. And uh, I saw uh, some of our planning commissioners out there, uh, Mr. Davis and uh, his wife with the, well, actually with the Historical Society uh, and um, it was just little league everybody it was it was insane um i also think the halloween the costume contest was really cool uh everyone did a good job and the uh the plumber building i didn't get to uh go into it this year but uh i'm pretty sure it was great uh my wife doesn't like things that jump out and so uh, we skip mazes but 
that being said, um, Chris, good job too. Uh, obviously, your staff uh, is a good reflection of the leadership here, I think, and so we're we're doing really good. So, um, I just I can't echo the positive feedback that I've heard from the community about it, and I hope you guys. Uh, it's what is wild is Halloween has turned into like a birthday. I mean, it's like all month long in San Dimas, it seems. And I don't know if it was because we did it early, perhaps, that it was like one of the first events for Halloween that I think people got to go to. Um, but then we've got the House of Horrors coming up here. And um, I think you guys are just doing a phenomenal job. I also want to say thank you um, to staff specifically on the PSQ project. It's been a long process uh, for all of you and, um, and for all of us. And I think uh, you guys have been patient and uh, you've produced a product or at least represented the city to produce a product to the council that uh, I think um, you did everything and you've done everything you can to make sure that we're going in the right direction for the city of San Dimas and the residents here. So thank you for that. And uh, I look forward to where we're going to go with that. Um, I lo also look forward to the Habitat for Humanity piece. Uh, that too, um, that project has been a, a lot of different things since I've been on council with a lot of different ideas. But uh, I think we arrived at the place and the use and the space that it needs to be. And I very much look forward to seeing that come to fruition. So thank you guys for... Uh, all your work on that as well as everyone else planning commission and everything that has uh, done all of their efforts for each part of that um, the only other thing uh, that I have is I hope everybody has a safe and happy Halloween um, as we come into this weekend and uh, I also think that um, as we approach Halloween it's just important that everyone's mindful of all the safety tips as it relates to candy. Um, and if you've been watching the news, um, some people think it's funny to put fentanyl in uh, candy uh, boxes and stuff like that. So uh, please inspect your children's candy and uh, do your due diligence to keep all your loved ones safe this Halloween. And please drive responsibly. I think, uh, you know, when you go down San Dimas Avenue, uh, Council Member Ebner's house, all the way up to uh, the Brummers and all the way down the other side, San Dimas Avenue just gets lit up with children uh, during that time and so does the downtown and uh, it can be a little dark so um, there's lots of cool lights and all those houses are really decked out really well uh, but every year when I uh, cruise down there uh, and I don't know whether the volunteers are gonna be uh, up there making sure everything's safe at Gladstone and Sandy Dimas Avenue um, but there is a substantial turnout that seems to go up and down that block so I do ask that everyone is mindful drive slowly on Halloween drink responsibly if that's what you're going to do uh, or just call Uber but nevertheless uh, thank you so much and the oh one last thing uh, doing my due diligence on the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District uh, I will tell you that September and October are the most terrible months for mosquitoes and so uh, there was a rather comprehensive presentation uh, if you haven't um, if you have any interest in mosquitoes I'll post it on my social media uh, some of the information but the bottom line is please tip toss your water um, get rid of it if you have a lot of vegetation in your backyard um, you know you can call the mosquito and vector control district ask them to come out and uh, give you some advice uh, what's fascinating is the mosquitoes we have in this area um, one mosquito can be responsible for multiple bites on one person um, and their day biters and they have adapted to breed in the lids of buckets and so it's really fascinating stuff um, but at the end of the day and these bites are like welts they're insane they get really ugly um, I can show you some if you need to see them but the bottom line is they are terrible so um, you know use off deet whatever you need to do um, but please 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 do your part um, to go ahead and tip and toss standing water uh, so that you don't uh, breed it and Okay, this is the last, last thing, I swear. Uh, I was at the golf uh, course. Um, I went to the golf course committee meeting. Um, I look forward, for those that play golf, 
uh, our golf course uh, should hopefully by let's say June or earlier next year should have uh, its um, recreation hall the banquet hall should be back up and running uh, we should have a new facility with some really awesome features that I think uh, the whole community is going to enjoy uh, big open glass windows um, a bridal suite uh, at the actual Canyon Country Club and uh, if you haven't been up there uh, you should get up there, uh, check it out, and um, even though the uh, banquet hall is not open right now, uh, they are, the course is open, and it is awesome, and there are plenty of deer, if you get there earlier, who are willing to uh, entertain you. So, Council Member uh, Weber and I had the opportunity to play in a, a tournament recently, and I want to thank our San Dimas Sheriff Station uh, for all their efforts, uh, both um, in the community and just being a part of this community, both uh, using facilities and spaces within the city uh, for events to support the San Dimas Station family, as well as participating in our events like a Halloween Spooktacular. I think that people, the, the radio cars were decked out really cool, and it really demonstrates to people that law enforcement officers are people too and uh, show some humanity and some humility so pass the, my thanks on to your team and everyone that attended thank you so much thank you ryan john well uh, i will just echo what ryan said about the halloween spooktacular that was that was great um and he kind of went over it uh, earlier in the day there was a, another part of it the uh, started out with the running scared event and I'm happy to announce that 40% of the city council ran in that race. <laughs> so uh, they were the two Eric's, as a matter of fact, and they both did very well, actually. So that was, uh, and that was really fun. And uh, the one mile, of course, was, was less stressful and even more fun for the participants. Um, yeah, good job, Eric and Eric. Um, but uh, our Parks and Rec staff is not finished, as has been mentioned. We've got the Walker House of Horrors coming up, and that is on this coming Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You have to go online to get tickets. There are still some available, so you, uh, you would, would be well to do that as soon as possible. Um, also, um, next, not this coming Saturday, but the next Saturday, uh, we have Bowser Bash happening at, up at Horse Thief Canyon Park, and that's from 10 to 1. And the only other thing I have to bring up is that uh, just uh, something I, I want to request uh, for a future agenda item. Um, there, as you might, as you know, we have uh, an AP, Administrative Professional Zone, that goes up San Dimas Avenue to 4th Street. In that stretch, north of 1st Street and up to about, uh, on one side up to 2nd, on the other side up to the, uh, halfway up to 4th Street between 3rd and 4th, there are houses there. And these houses are in the AP zone. The problem is that there are people who have bought those houses and like the houses and are fixing up the houses. And so a resident called and said, you know, we're gonna, we wanna do some improvements, but I can't get a home equity loan because although we allow those uses to stay, we don't allow them to be rebuilt if 50% of the house, house is destroyed and uh, lenders don't like that provision. So in talking with our planning staff, Ken Fichtelman in particular, he suggested one line that could be added to the AP zone to allow whatever the line says, and I'm not sure exactly what it is, but whatever that is to allow these homeowners to be able to get home equity loans because the houses would be able to re be rebuilt. Um, so I'm requesting a discussion of this not necessarily next meeting or anything, but at some time in the near future so we can address that concern. And I just... I could support that. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Mayor. And uh, that's about it for me. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Oh, Eric and Eric. Um, both of these guys, both of these guys ran in that uh, race. Uh, I think they, as Eric Nakano mentioned, that the old guy uh, ran and he was in a whole different, uh, no, you're the old guy. I, I, that's that's right. right. And the young guy, the guy, young guy, they both said that they ran good. And I took, I'll take their word for it. All, I, I will say that all five of the council members were there. And that I'm going to let Eric tell the world. 
Well, I would like to congratulate uh, Councilman Weber. He was at the head of the pack, but as I had, as the mayor alluded to, he was in a different age bracket than I was, so that explains why I was five minutes behind him. Um, but it was a lot of fun, and I was glad to partake in it. So thank you all for staff for putting on a great event. I look forward to participating next year, and hopefully I'll be able to up my game a bit, get a few more runs in before that. You'll be in the same age bracket. Yeah. <laughs> Then all the more reason why I think you should you should run. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did have one matter I did want to discuss unrelated to uh, Halloween. Uh, as as all of us know, there have been many outages, electrical outages in the city. Uh, residents have I think contacted all of us at some point concerned about these outages. Uh, so I would move to request that we have a senior representative from Southern California Edison uh, to answer questions, present uh, an analysis of what's going on, uh, and that we give the public the opportunity to weigh in um, on these uh, on these outages and provide some feedback to uh, Southern California Edison. I'm supportive of having the representative come. Uh, the only thing that I would would say is we have a great representative from our liaison from Southern California Edison, but I believe we need somebody who's more into the engineering world um, from Edison that knows more about what the problems are versus a community relations type event. So I would request that staff meet and talk with them to f find out who that person would be. Not, you know, um, like I said, Marissa's great, but the reality is there's, uh, I think we're far past that level of, uh, consideration by the Edison when it's this is becoming a weekly event that somebody's getting called or somebody uh, is uh, standing still so if you don't mind I would prefer you guys reach out to them Chris and bring somebody who not only just turns the lights on but turns the lights off yeah we'll let the person who answers the front phones Tell, give them the night off and we'll get somebody who's a senior level individual. Thank you. I, I was just curious about your request. Is it you, you're looking to have somebody come give a presentation regarding it or are you looking for more of a, um, an interactive uh, type of setting for residents? Both. So it would be an opportunity to present why the outages are so frequent. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be curious to know their explanation. Last time I think it was squirrels were eating cables or something, and I, I'd want to know if that's still the case. And then uh, obviously have it open to the public so the public can weigh in as well, because um, members of uh, residents who live and have contacted me, especially upset about this, have medical conditions. And so when things go out, they have to get their generator up and running so that their medications in their fridges uh, don't spoil, stuff like that. I think it's really important to give them an opportunity to express the impact that these have on them. It's not just resetting clocks on a stove. It's, you know, th these are serious matters. Uh, and so uh, that would be my request is to do both. I, I wonder, well, squirrels are hungry during this time of year, just to be clear. Um, but I wonder if it would be better suited maybe for a, um, I don't want to say a study session, but I mean, it, we've done a like public safety uh, type of town hall before or one of those type of things. I just think the it, to get what you really are trying to get out of it to allow residents to ask questions and get out of the formality of, of this setting. I wonder if that would be more fruitful uh, to still have your presentation and the explanation, uh, but to be able to allow the residents to voice their concerns and actually get responses. I think that is a worthy suggestion, and I'll I'll uh, I'll offer. A, I don't know how does that work. A substitute motion instead of how would you do that? I would just a request. Want to, I request yeah. Yeah. then that that takes place. I I, I think that uh, uh, both are very good suggestions, but. Uh, if we did like a town hall, uh, you w I think it would be important that we have it in this room to be able to make sure that we can reach out to the television public. You know, if normally we do a town hall. We do it's like over at the plumber building or something to have different sets. sets. But I think we would need, we want to get it out to the entire community 
like even those that are, you know, at home watching. So I don't know how that would work, but I think that that's something the staff could talk about and, and work with them. I think we can handle that. What I'm hearing is we want a senior level person to present and address and interact with the public about the seriousness of the outages and to do it in a fashion that people can see it from home. G so we'll work on it. Didn't we do it for, uh, we've televised like PSQ from the senior center, other important meetings. Could that, we not do that? That's what, uh, that's what I was looking to, but I mean, staff, they've done it many times before, so we'll, we'll get something, a good venue for it. It's really important to get the, it's the individuals from Southern Edison that are the important part to make sure you get the right people that are addressing it. And oh, so, I, th I think I, I partially agree. I think the, the residents that Eric's talking about being heard is is important and i think that this setting with just we talk you talk order you know and all that stuff uh meetings need to be orderly but i do want people to have that good opportunity to ask their questions raise their hands be acknowledged say what they need to say and allow us to be in a venue that allows that to happen yeah we've had some good town halls at at, at the senior hall okay and uh They've worked out good. PSQ was at the senior hall. Charter Oaks was at the senior senior hall. So these guys are used to being able to set up chairs. <laughs> uh, all, both of those in the goal lines were all very enjoyable. But in, we will definitely, that's the venue I was thinking, is the senior center. Yeah, well, that's, we don't have to worry about the Pioneer Square right now. So let's move on to something more as important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Eric, anything else? That's all, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I'll just share my uh, my uh, tactic for how to set the clock on my stove when the power goes out because it goes out so often. And that's just to never set it. I, I just leave it alone and just know that the the <laughs> clock on the stove is always wrong. That's uh, it's much more effective than having to reset it every time. Um, I. I'm going to say the same thing that everybody else said. The spectacular sounds like it was an amazing time. I didn't make it out to it. I, uh, I had prior engagements, but uh, everything that I heard was all positive. Uh, and then also, thank you for putting on the, uh, the Run a Scared 5K. And I will just say that I'm the back-to-back -back council 5K champion. Um, so uh, we might go for a three-peat here. We're not sure. but You know, can we put like a certificate or plaque <laughs> right on the wall behind Eric? <laughs> The running champ yeah yeah well you know i'm, I'm a humble guy so <laughs> that's it thanks hey thanks eric everybody was out rooting eric on um and it did well um you know i talked with scott wasserman at the spectacular event and he said that our staff planned for one number okay then he said but we went ahead and planned for two times that number and then they ended up with four times that number and i'll tell you right now when i arrived there later in the evening uh the place was full there had to still be a line all the way across community park and uh, i'm not going to say that the staff looked up when it started raining and said Hallelujah. But the reality is it started raining and they had to, you know, call the event, but they could have gone until midnight. There was so many people. And I think it was truly the, the because it was the beginning, the first one in the, in the local area. But they did a great job and, and you should be very proud of all your staff. And I'm not going to say that to, to uh, Chris. Yeah, it's a good idea. Okay. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you to the staff, thank you to Pioneer Square, thank you to the council, and thank you to the community. We got through a very arduous process that took a lot of time, and, uh, but I think the community needs to know that they were always being heard. Okay, but there's so many things that go on behind closed doors, and it's sad, but that's just the way the process is. You have closed sessions, we can't discuss it with, with people, 
We can't tell the community, especially during these negotiations. So I want to thank the, the, the developers who, at, on their own initiative, reached out to the community and kept them somewhat involved in what was happening. But I just want to ensure that, it, that the community knows that we weren't ignoring them, but just unfortunately the way the process works, the way the state uh, has us kind of confined, the Brown Act and all those other things that are going on, uh, but you are all being heard and we appreciate your, cons your concern. Uh, we believe, or at least I believe, this is going to be a great project at the end of the day. Um, it will be one of the things that we all can be proud of, just like the downtown is. We're proud of it the way it is. And this is a, the next step in the way of building the downtown area. Unfortunately, it's got a big old wall in between it, but uh, a train track and, and whatever. But if we, if we do what we keep thinking we're going to do, we're going to be able to incorporate that right into the downtown area. And maybe things will happen at the packing house and at the... Uh, the bowling alley and all kinds of stuff, uh, good things happening. So I just wanted to say that. Another thing is that earlier this evening, we made a presentation to uh, our baseball player, our major league baseball player, who come here from San Dimas and stuff. And as you notice, we did something a little bit different. We actually reached out to a local business here and asked them to help us out and get this nice, nicely framed. And I wanted to say, hey, Linco over on Arrow Highway, thank you very much. We got there at 6 o'clock last night, and at 10 o'clock this morning, we picked up this very custom frame, and uh, he was proud to do it. And I just think that, um, that community members like that uh, make us proud to be here in San Dimas. And thank you, uh, Steve Linderman and, and his daughter and his family. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to say any more because Ryan said plenty enough, but he, the reason why Ryan knows that he doesn't have to stay for the, for the closed session so he can talk all he wants, and John can talk all he wants, and so I'm going to talk more. No. Anybody uh, opposed to adjourning the meeting? I just need to say I'll be recusing well, myself go. from the two closed sessions due to a real property conflict. And same here. Okay, hang on. Chris? Would you, uh, there's a written, the introduction to the closed session to read in public. Uh, would you like me to do that? Yeah, would you please? At this time, we will be going into cl our closed session to discuss two cases. Both cases are conferences with legal counsel, existing litigation between the city of San Dimas versus Metro Gold Line Foothill Extension Construction Authority. Okay. Any opposition to closing? Thank you very much. We'll see you in two weeks.